Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments. Alamance County is pleased to present the Alamance County Commissioner's Meeting. Call the meeting to order. I do note that we have a quorum. Uh, and additionally, uh, Bill Lashley will not be at our next meeting or this meeting. Uh, he had a medical issue uh, middle of last week uh, and is in the hospital, is doing much, much better. I'm talking to the family on an everyday basis, multiple times, and he's uh, recovering and doing much, much better. And we hope that he'll be back very soon. Also, Ms. Thompson has a personal issue uh, and will be about 30 minutes late. So we're gonna go ahead and proceed um, at this point. Okay, Mr. Turner. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, the book of James has much to say on prayer. It instructs us that in times of sickness and infliction, we are to pray for one another. We pray for our colleague, Bill. We pray for your healing hand upon him, that you may grant wisdom and discernment and compassion to those who are caring for him and give strength to his family who are with him. The book instructs that we are to call the elders of the church to pray for one another. There are countless church leaders in this county praying for our colleague at this time. The book instructs that the prayers of the righteous has power. And we ask that you, the he, that Bill feels the power of prayer from the county and that he might feel your presence and that your healing hand will bring him back very soon. In your name we pray, amen. 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 Will you stand with me? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We have two of these things we do uh, usually at the beginning of our meetings, which are very special. Uh, we have two such occurrences this morning. The first is the uh, we're doing a proclamation for motor, uh, Motorcycle Safety Awareness Month. We've done that for the last at least 10 years that I'm aware of. Uh, and so if you motorcyclists would come forward. Come on up, guys. <laughs> Don't be bashful. The name of your group is? The Gypsy Desert. All right. And? We're the Concerned Bikers Association of Alamance. Excellent. Um, and you are with Susan Brothers. Pardon? You are also with Susan Brothers as one of your members. I talked to her. I understand that part of your group is going to a uh, funeral for uh, a stricken officer. Yes. All right. Um, well, gentlemen, when I say gentlemen, I know there are female bikers as well, Susan Brothers being one. There are. <laughs> okay. It'll help if I pull my glasses out. I have that same Okay, this is a proclamation for Motorcycle Safety Awareness Month. That is the month of May, in this case, 2024. Whereas, as more and more residents are uh, turning to motorcycles as a form of transportation, 
And with the warmer weather approaching, it is time to remind property owners to do their part to keep the grass clippings and yard debris off the roadways and encourage others to be alert and share the road with motorcyclists uh, and other types of small vehicles. Uh, off the record, I passed a vehicle yesterday that was three vehicles, and it, the back looked like a car and the front looked like a motorcycle. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas the National Highway Safety uh, Traffic Safety Administration and the Motorcycle Safety have named the uh, May Motorcycle Safety Awareness Month, and May is traditionally the first time that uh, a number of the motorcyclers return to the road, and it increases. And whereas motorcycle riding is not only a proper form of recreation and transportation, for thousands of citizens across North Carolina and Alamance County, but an economical means of transportation that reduces fuel consumption and road wear and helps to alleviate traffic and parking congestion. And whereas North Carolina has over 250 registered motorcyclists and more than 200,000 200, licensed drivers, who are either motorcycle endorsement or a motorcycle learner's permit. And whereas across the state of uh, the state in 2022, there were 3,743 motorcycle related crashes that resulted in 206 fatalities and 2,869 motorcyclists seriously injured. And I might add there Having practiced law for 50 years, I see over and over and over, it's almost never the motorcyclist's fault. It's someone not seeing or not being careful enough. Whereas, it is important that the citizens of North Carolina and Alamance County be aware of motorcyclists on our roadways and recognize the importance of motorcycle safety and share the roadways. And, whereas, the safe operation of motorcycles is enhanced through a combination of rider training and experience, good judgment, a knowledge of traffic laws and licensing requirements, and the use of highly visible safety gear. Whereas several organizations, such as the Alamance County Concerned Bikers and the Patriot Guard Riders, um, and your group is? Gypsy Justice, um, and others share the local motorcycle club and riding social clubs, are committed to increasing the safety, safe operations of motorcycles by promoting rider safe, safety education programs. And whereas Motorcycle uh, Safety Awareness Month is designed to increase public awareness about motorcycles, and safety sharing board uh, and the safety sharing board with motorcyclists and to encourage their safe and proper use among motorcycle riders and now therefore be it resolved that the Alamance county board of commissioners do hereby proclaim the month of may as motorcycle awareness month in Alamance county north carolina and urge all citizens to join in this effort to promote uh, awareness, mutual respect, and safety on our roads and board. I would make the motion. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 And that's signed already by myself as chair and by Tory Frank as clerk to the board. Um, this is 6th day of May, 2024. And gentlemen? Thank you very much. Thank you. I also have a statement I'd like to make. I'm sorry. Absolutely. If I can be... Uh, and you, and you'll... Yeah. Okay. If you will, turn around so the audits can see you and the cameras can see you. Okay. Close. <laughs> <laughs> I guess over here... That would be right. wonderful. All right. 
Uh, we're accepting the Concerned Bikers Association is accepting this on behalf of um, uh, our president, um, um, Chris Holmes, who could not be here today. Uh, my name is Joseph Ferguson, and I am the legislative coordinator for the Concerned Bikers Association of Alamance County. Um, okay, let's see if I can read this. <laughs> All right, we'd, we'd like to thank the uh, county for the acknowledgement of uh, May being Motorcycle Safety Awareness Month uh, for all of the biker community. It's a concern throughout the year, our safety. All right, what we'd like to do is, uh, in accepting this proclamation, we'd like to ask the board to please review the North Carolina um, Department of Transportation uh, uh, motorcycle crash data and maps, specifically for Alamance County. Um, the highest rate of incidents uh, in this county are, um, they occur on state roads that bisect and intersect throughout the county. All right, and, and through, um, it takes the voice of county authority to request to the state traffic safety unit to evaluate these roads to improve visibility and, uh, and increase safety for all the people who share the roads in Alamance County. Um, I'd also like to thank you for, um, for the care and attention to this matter and to uh, the concerns of motorcyclists countywide of this county. And um, I have taken the liberty of leaving my card with my phone number on the desk. Um, I would be more than happy to work with anyone on the board in order to make these things come to fruition. Um, I am I am very motivated to work with you. I'll be looking forward to it. Thank you very much. And we thank you as well. Um, Mr. And Chairman. If you want to go ahead and say something as well. Absolutely. Just, uh, I happen to be the commissioner that is a uh, on the board of uh, TAC, or the TAC committee. All right. Um, thank you, everybody, for being here this morning. I'd like to thank the board for the proclamation declaring May as Motorcycle Awareness Month. Um, as a member of the Gypsy Jesters, um, we are very community involved, not just with the biker community, but also with the community in general. Um, we've made donations to Little Pink Houses for Hope, the Disabled Vets uh, Organization here in the county, um, the uh, uh, Conservator Center out there on the backside of Mebane with the uh, Big Cat Sanctuary. Um, and these are, you know, just some of the things that we've done. Um, I have been teaching the driver's ed portion, the motorcycle awareness portion of the driver's ed curriculum in the driver's ed programs in our high schools here in the county uh, for about 18 years now. Um, in the past two years, I've done, all, I've, I've spoken in front of almost 900 kids a year uh, to get them to look out for motorcycles when they start driving. Uh, this year, I'm already up to 250. Uh, we have had to slow down a little bit with it because the driver's ed program is trying to catch back up with the actual driving portion of it. So they've kind of slowing the classes down a little bit. But uh, that's something that's near and dear to my heart because I figure if I can catch them when they're young, they'll look out for the motorcyclists as they get older. Um, so that's why I've been doing this for, like I say, 18 years. Um, and it's something that means a lot to me. So. Um, you know, when the board is, if you have anything to do with school systems and stuff like that, keep that in mind that the driver's ed program is very important in our school systems. I know we've had in the past, there's been, you know, talk of removing it and whatnot. And I've gone to Raleigh and sat down with the politicians and talked to them. And, you know, we have great representatives in Raleigh from Alamance County, and I have a great relationship with all of them. And uh, I go and see them at least once a year. 
um, sometimes twice, and we discuss many different things for the county uh, because our group is concerned about everything that goes on in the county. We support the other groups. We support uh, the veterans groups and stuff like that, especially because many of our members are veterans. So, but thank you again, and we do appreciate it. Thank you all for being here. And we want to thank all of you um, and the Patriot Guard Thanks. riders as well. Uh, they are not here. They showed up last uh, last meeting, uh, and it was one meeting too early. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and today they're doing a ride for a fallen officer. So we want to thank all three groups. Gentlemen, thank you for keeping us safe. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Be safe, guys. Thank you much. Thank you, sir. Take care. Motion to approve the agenda, Mr. Chair. All right, hang on one second. We've got one more proclamation. At this point, I'll ask our clerk to the board to come forward. We have a proclamation, uh, and as we've done the last several years, uh, this is recognition of May the 5th through the 11th, 2024, as clerks to the Board of County Commissioners Week. Uh, this lady is our clerk to the board, uh, has done a wonderful job for many, many, many years. Uh, Not too many. <laughs> <laughs> But not that many. <laughs> yeah. Don't listen to this guy. <laughs> uh, and we really appreciate you. Okay. We're recognizing May the 5th through the 11th, 2024. And whereas the role of the clerk to the Board of County Commissioners is critical for maintaining an informed community and facilitating effective local government through uh, communication among citizens, governing bodies, and administrative departments. And whereas the position of clerk, one of the oldest in local government, continues to be essential to, uh, as to the office of record keeping of their counties with responsibilities that are deeply rooted in history. And whereas the North Carolina General Assembly um, General Statute number 153A 111 requires every board of county commissioners to appoint a, uh, and designate a clerk to the board to perform the duties that may be required by law or the board of commissioners including but not limited to the preparation of filings and protection of local government records which are vital for accountability and transparency and I'm going to interrupt there. And she saved my bacon, by the way, uh, a couple of weeks ago because the uh, closed session, which had never been broadcast before, she recorded. And therefore, it is available thanks to this lady right here who did the recording. Uh, the recording's available. It was not broadcast, but was recorded. Okay. Um, Whereas the cl uh, clerks enhance their professional skills through active participation in the North Carolina Association of County Clerks to Boards of Commissioners, which is in partnership with the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill School of Government and the International Institute of Municipal Clerks, offers nationally recognized certification programs and continuous professional education. I'm going to interrupt again. This lady holds the highest credentials uh, and is known not only county-wise, state-wise, but nationally. Back to my, what I'm supposed to be doing. Whereas uh, clerks, through their dedication to professional development, not only improve the efficiency of their offices, but also bring positive recognition to the counties by participating in advanced education in obtaining professional related certifications. Now, therefore, 
It is proclaimed by the Alamance County Board of Commissioners that May 5th through May 11, 2024, <coughs> will be recognized as clerk to the board of County Commissioners Week in Alamance County and extends its appreciation to the clerk of our board, Tori Frank, and Deputy Clerk Deanna Yancey, and all other clerks with their vital services they perform and the exemplary dedication to the county, to this county, and all other counties. This is the commissioners. Do we have a motion? So move. Second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 It's unanimous. This is the sixth day of May, 2024, and I have the pleasure of recognizing you and, and clerks. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Get it? Okay, at this point, we have reached a point of um, a resolution. Yeah, I'm come back to that. A well, let me first go back to the approval of the agenda. Is there any discussion about the agenda? Motion to approve. Second. I have a motion to approve. Second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Unanimous. Okay. We have a resolution uh, as to the recording and broadcasting of meetings for Alamance County and the Alamance County Board of Commissioners. Um, if you went to your minutes and so forth, as I hope all of you did, uh, both in person and in uh, broadcast land, uh, I now know what to call it, broadcast land. So, uh, and if you did that, you saw a resolution but may I read the resolution and make this uh, proposal? Whereas the Alamance County Board of Commissioners is a public body subject to the North Carolina Oops Meeting Law, uh, North Carolina General Statute Number 143, Article 33C, and whereas it is pub the public policy of North Carolina and Alamance County that the hearings uh, deliberations and actions of the Board of Commissioners and its committees be conducted openly except for otherwise provided in this in accordance with the applicable law. Each official meeting of the Alamance County Board of Commissioners is open to the public and any person is entitled to attend such meeting and, and by the way, the work session that's uh, being discussed was open to the meeting most of you guys in the audience were there uh, and our, and so forth, and it is available by recording currently. Whereas, pursuant to North Carolina General Statute 143.318.14, the broadcasting or recording of meetings uh, by any radio or television station is allowed uh, for all or any part of the meetings required to be open any person may photograph, film, tape record, or otherwise reproduce any part of the meetings required to be open and, whereas although the North Carolina Open Meetings Law does not require the Board of County Commissioners to broadcast or record its meetings, the broadcast, the Board of uh, Alamance County County Commissioners had broad, has broadcast and recorded its general meetings for a number of years and in the past and continues to desire to provide access to the public to view all meetings in person uh, through online live streaming or via recording, which are later available to view on demand. That accepts closed sessions and things that by law are not open. Whereas the Board of County Commissioners will continue to the 
greatest extent possible given the availability of appropriate technology resources and subject to unforeseen techni technological or other limitations to provide government transparency in order to better accommodate the interest of the public in matters before the Board of Commissioners and to establish a method by which interested members of the public may have access to all public meetings in person, virtually or by recordings available on demand. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Board of County Commissioners uh, of Alamance County, one, that the Alamance County Board of Commissioners directs Alamance County staff to use appropriate technology and personnel resources to facilitate the audio and video recording of each of its official meetings and to make timely publication of those thereafter. And two, that the foregoing resolution be formally accepted and adopted to take effect upon passage. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Do I have a motion second? Any discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 It's unanimous and welcome. I'm sorry, I had a family crisis this morning, I'm sorry. No, we announced that you have Okay, a... thank you. Okay, this is the fourth day of May, 2024. Uh, I am very pleased with this board and our IT folks with their continued uh, appreciation of the open meetings and our uh, publication of these meetings by broadcasting. Thank you. Okay. Next, public comments. We only have two speakers. Uh, speakers, you have three minutes. Uh, you will go to the podium, please, and speak from the podium so you can be both seen and heard. And I'm going to ask uh, the county to possibly add a move a light or whatever so you can see the... I noted when I looked online, uh, the visibility of the speaker is less than it is here and so forth where there's less lighting. So if we could accommodate that at some future point. Okay. Um, David Bloom, am I pronouncing that correctly? I think he spoke earlier during the proclamation. Okay. You're right. He was one of the, the, uh, the bikers. Uh, and Amia Klein. Oh, Tanya Klein, I'm sorry. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. State your name and address and then continue, please. Okay. Um, dear Chair and Commissioners, my name is Tanya Klein and I live in Elon on Brookview Drive. Thank you for the work you do and your dedication to Alamance County. I'm a former school social worker and parent to two high schoolers in ABSS, although I can only say that for one more year because I have a senior. Um, the current third-party study of the HVAC systems and the roofs and the subsequent funding to address the most urgent needs there um, is an encouraging sign that progress is being made to provide safe and healthy facilities for our students. I'm here today to address the importance of certain school staff that meet the needs of our students. Some indicators of success for our students that are regularly discussed are demonstrating proficiency in math, reading, and science, good attendance, and our graduation rate. It was very alarming to learn from the ABSS special call meeting on Friday that many of these, the positions that are being eliminated are positions that are directly tied to success in these areas. Even though they are not classroom positions, they still provide support to teachers and have a direct impact on students' safety, well-being, and outcomes. Librarians support student success by being an instructional partner to teachers by providing access to information across a variety of media and technology, as well as teaching students to use critical thinking skills when evaluating information and media. The school instructional specialists support teachers by coordinating curriculum, analyzing data, and ensuring that instruction is aligned with student needs. Graduation coaches provide assistance to students individually and in groups regarding high school graduation and completion. They identify and work directly with students 
that are at risk of not graduating, tracking their progress and resolving barriers to graduation. The student support vacancies that will not be filled leave our students without a nurse or school social worker in every building. Social workers are tasked with improving student attendance, overcoming barriers to learning, and addressing urgent issues that impact student safety. Nurses work to keep students in school over sending them home, whether it is a minor health issue or, or, or more complex illnesses such as diabetes. These teams, which include school counselors, also assess students that are having suicidal thoughts and mental health concerns, keeping them safe and connecting their families to resources. The people in these positions, along with school counselors, help teachers stay focused on teaching by handling these concerns. As county commissioners, I understand your primary responsibility is this, um, to the school system is facilities. However, other counties use local funds to reinstate master's pay, offer competitive supplements, and more. Today, I'm asking you to consider fully more, coming closer to fully funding our schools and not just giving the $10 million or so that they're going to ask for to keep their budget and keep things running. I ask you to consider funding all positions that directly impact student success. And we thank you. We next have the consent agenda. Do I have a motion? Motion to approve. Second. A motion to approve and second. Any discussion? There being none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Again, unanimous. Guys, we're on a roll. That's good. <laughs> Okay, uh, Brian Lewis and Amanda Scott. <laughs> Are they online or? I believe that was part of your consent agenda. Oh, I'm sorry. You, you're exactly the correct. The appointment of them to the Senior Services Committee. Next is going to be uh, Victoria Duncan. Morning, commissioners. I am not Latora, no, but I, I'm going <laughs> to introduce this item and then Didn't turn it over to them. Didn't take that one out. <laughs> um, so at your last meeting, at your request, um, you asked for... I'll you are to the audience. Is that Tony Lojadiche, health director for Alamance County. Thank you. At your last meeting, uh, at your request, you asked for an overview of what adult treatment court is. And so we reached out to Latora Duncan, who has done wonderful work um, in the justice system, for the justice system, over the last many, many years. She was a detention officer, probation officer, and now the treatment court coordinator um, in Durham County. Um, she's been great to reach out to. Many sources that we reach out to, a wealth of information as we build the program here in Alamance County. And she hasn't ghosted us once when we sent an email or a phone call. She gets back to us right away. So we appreciate that. And uh, without further ado, I'll just turn it over to Latora and uh, let her do her presentation. And I hope traffic was not terribly bad between here and there. Oh, no, it was smooth selling. <laughs> Good morning, um, as he said. My name is Lentora Duncan. I am the coordinator for Durham County's uh, Drug Treatment Court. When Ashley uh, reached out to me and said that Alamance was looking to implement Drug Treatment Court, she came and um, she observed me, got all the resources and information that she needed. And like he said, every time she uh, calls me or email me, I give her uh, what she wants and any support that she may need in implementing um, Drug Treatment Court. Um, I've been the coordinator for Drug Treatment Corps in Durham County for going on two years. Um, and just to tell a little bit about the um, department that I do work under, which is the Justice Services uh, Department, uh, we have our community-based services, we have our detention services, we have our court services and our collaborations. Um, here today with me, I have our mental health and substance use program manager, formerly the mental health uh, coordinator of our mental health uh, court. Um, drug treatment court, it's simple. It is a 12 to 18 month uh, program. It can be longer. It all depends on the individual themselves. Um, and as we call it, it's an alternative to incarceration. And of course the program is post uh, conviction. So that means that they have to be placed on probation. We do not take anybody that is on post release. We don't take, um, sex offenders, um, as well. 
And of course, like I said, we do have our mental health court diversion uh, program that is up and uh, running. And I just spoke to Ashley and them this morning. We're actually looking to implement a treatment uh, family court and a DWI court. Um, Drug treatment court uh, overall um, is big. Um, I'm not sure if anybody is familiar with the All Rise. All Rise is formerly known um, as the National Adult uh, Drug Court uh, profes uh, Professionals. Um, and the first actual drug court uh, started in uh, Miami uh, Day. For, for Durham, um, it started in 1999. Um, it was funded by AOC, uh, which is the Administrator of Court, um, all the way up until 2012. And then the funding uh, took a, uh, got eliminated, and then Durham County identified that it was very uh, needed in Durham County to keep the Drug Treatment Court up and running. So they actually fund uh, two of our positions, which is uh, myself, my coordinator, and the case manager. And here I'll show you where we get most of our funding, which is the ABC Board, the Alcohol Board of uh, Commissioners. We do most of our training through um, All Rise and the National uh, Drug Court Institution. They will come to you free of charge, and they will um, give you all the training and the resources uh, that you may need. And also, um, we do rely on AOC, um, Alexia, and now Christian. They do come in, and they do some training with us um, as well. All right. And... We do abide by the North Carolina Drug Court um, Act of 1995. They have best practice standards um, as well that we do follow <coughs> along with the uh, All Rise. Um, the best practice standards is um, our target population. Our target population is the high risk, high need um, individuals, equity and inclusion, roles and responsibility of the judge. The judge is your highest person that sits on the team. Um, he makes mostly uh, <coughs> the final decisions. Me, myself, the coordinator, I'm just making sure that the um, program itself is up and running. Everybody is trained. Everybody knows the new information that is out there about um, any treatment court. We do incentive sanctions and service adjustments with those incentives and stuff. We get that from the AB board of funding. Uh, for those that don't know, here in North Carolina, every ABC that is in a county, they um, have to actually give a certain percentage back to the community. So they offer uh, grants um, to the community. You can apply for them. And since I've been here, we have uh, received that grant, but um, they've been given grants since, I believe, I want to say uh, 2020. 2020. Okay. Um, and in our program, we do uh, substance use, mental health, um, trauma treatment, and uh, recovery uh, management. Um, we look at recovery capital. It just brings it all together. It looks at the family, transportation, all those things that a person may need. We do frequent drug testing. Um, it is random. It's frequent. It's a part of the best practice standards. Um, our most our Multidisciplinary team, it consists of a judge, an ADA, um, a public defender, probation officer. You can have a case manager um, if that's what the team decides that they want to do. We have our tr uh, treatment providers that sit on the team, and we have a liaison from the police department. You can bring in um, someone from the sheriff department as well that sits on the team. All right. And we have a total of five phases. The first phase is just the orientation process, just get them in um, to learn about the program, making sure they become stable. The second phase is the change phase. By that time, they could kind of already know what to do, what not to do. And then you have phase three, self-sufficient. You can do this on your own. We can kind of take back some things like maybe uh, lessen the amount of drug screens that they have to do. Then we have the advanced phase. And then after that, we have the aftercare phases, which is right before the uh, graduation. These are all those that sit on our lovely team. Treatment providers that we use in the community. Um, one unique thing about the department that I work for, we actually um, have substance abuse counselors in-house. So that is our main uh, treatment provider. But of course, we do allow our participants to go outside of the department and they can use community partners um, at any of these uh, providers. ABC funding is our go-to. They help us with housing, uh, MAT, which is medica medication assistant treatment, incentives, transportation, treatment, aftercare. Um, and recently, we were um, awarded a SAMC uh, grant that allowed us to hire another counselor and to actually bring on a peer support specialist, because as you know, peer support specialist is becoming the big thing that is needed around here. So we now have a peer support specialist on our team. And we also um, was able to create a program. Um, we don't really call it the state cop program. 
Instagram. Um, the new name for it is called Facts, because uh, as you know, a lot of them like to use things like facts when referring to things. And so that program allow us to have contact with them five days a week so that we don't miss anything. And so they have hand on um, contact. And as you guys are in here doing proclamations, as you so you do know, May is actually National Treatment Court Month. Um, it was um, declared by Chief uh, Justice Paul Newby as the Treatment Court <coughs> Month here in uh, North Carolina. Here's just some of um, our data. Um, in 2023, we had a total of 41 clients. This year, currently, up until um, April, we had 22 um, clients. Uh, for our physical year, altogether, we've had 34 um, clients. Um, last year, the total uh, was 51 uh, clients. Up until this day, we've had four graduates, and for this month, we will have um, another graduate. Uh, drug treatment court, it changes um, as you learn the different resources um, that are out there. Um, I like to brag a little bit that when I did take on a drug treatment court, I had to make a lot of changes, and as you know, people don't like a lot of changes, but but as um, these changes come, they are more than uh, welcome uh, to them. And this is my contact um, information. If you have any questions, I'm here to answer them. <laughs> for sure. Thank you very much for being with us. Oh, yeah, you're welcome. Mr. Carter. Thank you for a good presentation. You're welcome. Ms. Thompson. We're just excited about it going to be here in this county because we desperately need it. Yep. All right. So you'll add on to the already 65 mm -hmm. uh, treatment courts that we have here in North Carolina, and there's over 4,000 in the state. When you guys got started, did you do any kind of collaboration with Orange County? Um, I believe they did. Um, recently, we actually just did a because they do different training throughout the year. We did a foundational uh, training with... Uh, I want to say Halifax County. Um, they actually uh, just implemented their drug treatment court and they came to Durham County uh, to train with us a little bit to get theirs going. So um, like I told Ashley, she reach out to um, Alexia and AOC, apply for the uh, grant that they have to have them come in and do the training. She can kindly tell them that she wants to train with Durham County and we'll come and we'll train uh, with them. You know, I know um, that we had talked about this a couple years ago about the ABC fines and things that was, could be a big part of that when it comes to funding. And fortunately, the opioid settlement lawsuits, all that has made a big, big deal with this kind of thing. And um, if you never, ever get a chance to go to Harnett County and sit a day with their veterans court, it's it's phenomenal, too. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, anything else? I don't believe the troublemaker. I'm going to ask her a couple of questions. Oh, no problem. Oh. <laughs> uh, First of all, what is the basis primarily of your funding? So the primary base actually currently is um, the ABC board. It comes from the ABC board. And that really just focuses on doing things for the participants, for housing, uh, for medication that they need, if there's clothing that they may need uh, for a new job. All that money is for that, for drug screens. They pay for all of our drug screens because, you know, it costs to, you know, do drug screens. But they are the base of our funding. But you also have grants. That is a grant. The ABC it is a grant. That's our main grant. We just received um, a grant from SAMHSA, and that allowed us to bring in another uh, counselor and create um, another program, another treatment um, aspect to our program. If you know, you may not. What is the amount of funding for the fiscal last year, the, the current year? 23, 24. So for that uh, grant, because how we do it is like it goes from June to uh, June through July, excuse me, um, and we were awarded 65000 And we are now currently applying for the July through June uh, grant from the ABC board. Right. For those out there in TV land and the audience, June 30 is the year end. July 1st is the beginning of a new year. Uh, what percentage of your 500 and some last year are actually graduates? Um, so I could brag a little bit more. Um, last year, um, how I put it from January to um, December, we had a total of nine graduates, and that is actually pretty high. That basically means you had a graduate for about every month um, that was in the year. Um, so for those that graduate, the percentage is 80%. Right. Um, those that don't 
reach the graduation or oh, that point of completion, why do you think it fails? Um, well, sometimes it fails. Um, the person may not be really ready for it. You have to be ready. This program is voluntarily first when you come. But then once you say this is what you want to do and a judge order it on someone's probation, it's no longer voluntarily. And so you are making that commitment to say that you want to do the work. And sometimes when they get in there and they really see how structured it is, you know, they kind of fall back and say this may not be what they want. And so sometimes we do have to terminate people, but when we do terminate them, it's not because, you know, you didn't, like, finish the program. It was more so because we didn't have all of the resources that was needed to help you because, as you know, you know, in our county, we do lack inpatient treatment, and that's one thing that is very needed in our program, you know, even if it's for detox purposes, those things like that. But we really do need more inpatient uh, treatments, and that goes for all of the counties. Do you have any suggestions for Alamance County as to how to make it more successful and have more graduations? Um, I would say just make sure you have enough treatment providers out here um, in the community. Make sure you have enough uh, funding that is going to sustain it. Keep it going. Um, look for that one funding that could at least get you every year or every five years. Um, that would be the most. Um, and it's treatment. It, just making sure you get that high risk, high need population. And how long does the program typically last for those graduates? Um, so the minimum is 12 months. And I don't like to put a max on it because, as I say, it all depends on that individual themselves with how they are progressing in the program. Yep. I want to thank you for being here. You're welcome. Thank Before, you. Any other questions? I just would like to add what you're talking about because um, one is a win with any kind of thing yes. that we got going on when it's just trauma and everything else. But um, um, I've said multiple times we could really use some additional residential places here because there's always a next. And this doesn't just get fixed. It really doesn't. I have a separate recovery class, and they're anywhere from 15 minutes to 15 years in recovery. Oh, yeah. And that's just another level of constant support because with <clears throat> anything that we face in life that owns us, so to speak, in our heads, it, it, we just don't 15 minutes and we're done. It's always going to be nagging us, and it's so important to believe in these folks because um, it's your kid, it's your parent, it's your anything. Oh, yeah. And um, sometimes people just make really tough choices that get them in that position, yep. and um, then that drug starts making all their decisions for them. Yep. So um, I can't say enough to support. And it's very frustrating if you're not in these shoes. It's just like, why? It's like domestic violence. Why doesn't she just leave? Yeah. Good luck with that. Yeah. So Recovery is a, is a long process. It continues. Yeah. It never stops. Yeah, that's exactly right. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank I've you. I've had uh, 50 years of practicing law. I've seen a lot of uh, everything from domestic cases to drug cases, you name it. Uh, Ms. Turner's, uh, yeah, you probably have as well as an attorney. Um, unfortunately, most successful uh, people that solve the problem, get out of the um, the habit, get out of the have got to reach a point they 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 personally want it. Yes. And do you have any suggestions on how to encourage them to get to that point or to get beyond that point and want change? Well, they have to trust the process. They're going to have to trust that team. They're gonna, it's it's going to take some time. That's why, you know, you have that first stage there, just trying to get them stable, get them a, um, acquainted with the program itself, but it's going to take them to trust. And there's three um, things that we do. It's called our motto for our drug treatment court is we ask that they show up, they try, and they be honest. And as long as those things are going in there, we really work with them. Do you require your folks to go to AA classes? Um, so that's a, on the treatment side. It depends on that individual themselves, how they see where they're at in the program, but they do require them. We call them community support meetings because we can't order someone to do, um, you know, NA or AA meetings, but we do um, encourage them to do community support meetings. Sometimes we'll hold uh, pro-social events, you know, like this week, um, taking them to a baseball game, um, you know, those things like that. And then on Friday, it's wear your favorite sports apparel in court. So anything to get them motivated to want to be there do the work two last things uh one you may want to say no but i'll ask you <laughs> uh as we set up our program and get started 
are you available to talk to us? Oh, yeah, always, Thank anytime. You. The yeah. second is, Donald Reese is our next speaker uh, with Vaya. You may want to stay and hear his presentation. Okay, yeah, I'm open to it. Always looking for resources to improve my program as well. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Donald, having just announced you. <laughs> Couldn't have set that up any better, I tell you. <laughs> I'm sitting there back there thinking that someone had all that planned up. Uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Donald Roos. I am the uh, Vice President of Behavioral Health and IDD Network Operations for VIA. Um, it's a long title, but it really just means I get the privilege of working closely with our counties around uh, developing new programs and new services and supports and really sitting down and trying to make things work more efficiently and better. Uh, a lot of times in our communities, we have a lot of things going on, but they're not all that connected to really be working efficiently for uh, people. Lori Whitson's with me here today. Uh, she's been on my team in network development and uh, has been spearheading a lot of the on the ground work here in Alamance County um, on where we're at. Our goal here today is to give you an update on where we are uh, with the Alamance, uh, I call it the Diversion Center, I have to remember, it's the Alamance Behavioral Health Center uh, is the new name for it. Uh, if you can remember, um, when you asked VIA to come into the county, the number one priority you gave us is creating a center where one-stop shop, where people can get all of their needs met. We can divert people from the ED. We can divert people from jail, get people access to all the services and the supports they need across uh, the system. So we're here today to talk to you a little bit about where are we at with that vision. Because, oh, I got the thing right here. So hopefully some of you guys uh, recognize some people in this photo. Uh, this is the groundbreaking that we had on the center back in November of 2022. A lot of good looking people uh, in that photo. Uh, and this is where we are today. Uh, this center is coming along. Um, it is shaping up. Uh, the outside there is looking uh, really great. The front there, you'll see that is where our law enforcement drop off will be, where a law enforcement can drop people off. Uh, the downstairs of the main facility you see there on the left is completely diversion. And so we'll talk a little bit about the services there, the upstairs um, outpatient services. We don't got a picture of it here, but you'll see it in later ones um, on the side. We have a whole uh, section that will also be for um, a pharmacy as well as child services for people and families to get their needs met. Because we know, like they said, is it's just not caring for an individual. You have to talk about the social system. You got to talk about the family. You got to support that whole unit. And we want to make sure that we can do that in this one center. So a couple of the services um, that you'll see in there, of course, some of the benefits uh, that we expect to see as we start rolling out this center. Uh, diversion from our criminal justice system. That was a big thing talking with the sheriff. We need people in services and treatment, getting access to supports they need not sitting in jail, right? We need to make sure that they're not reoffending, doing anything in the community. We want to make sure they're getting services and supports uh, that they need across the system. Uh, diversion from the um, uh, emergency room and the hospital uh, here at Cone. We don't want individuals sitting in the emergency room for long periods of time. Once they get into the hospital, it's hard to get people back out of the hospital because of federal MTALA laws and other regulations that prevent them from discharging uh, to lower levels of care uh, in the community. So we want to prevent people from having to go there if they don't need uh, to go to hospital stays. Uh, and we want to increase resources in Alamance County, especially for our medical services. We want to make sure if they're going out on a call and they find someone that has an overdose and maybe they use uh, naloxone uh, the, to reverse a drug overdose. We want to make sure that they can get that person to the, to the services. That's a prime opportunity for you to engage someone. People had a really significant event in their life. And you may like, that may be the opportunity where they need, where they decide, hey, I need to do something different with my life, right? We want to make sure that that connection's there. Um, and then a centralized continuum of crisis services. We don't want services to be all over the county, like mobile crisis is over here, and maybe there's a, a residential unit over here, and it's all scattered all over the place. We wanted to centralize that, right? So you got all your services in one place. They can all work together. It creates not only a synergy in the community because people know where to go. 
They don't have to look all over or look on their phone like, hey, if I want detox services, where do I go? And they're searching on their phone. Everybody knows where to drop for that. We hope to see increased access to care. So there's a lot of people in the community now not getting the care they need, which leads to people um, ending up in the criminal justice system, in the hospital, um, create, you know, creating issues in families. You're seeing it in your social services. You're seeing it in your health departments. Uh, so we really want to improve access. So we'll be coming back after launch, and we'll be sharing data with you on how we improve access to care in the county, um, creating centralized community resources like we talked about. Like right now, if you wanted to go to an AA meeting in the community, do you, does anybody know where to go for an AA meeting in Alamance County? And you know sometimes it changes. It's at the United Methodist Church one week, and the next week it's at the Episcopal Church, right? People sometimes can't find them when they're moving them around, right? So we want to create opportunities where, hey, if you want to go, this is a place where you can find it. Make it easy and efficient for people to go, right? It's like any other thing in life. We want things to be easy for us. Um, if it's too hard, we're not going to use it. Um, and healthy and, and really improve the health and the well-being of Alamance County is hopefully where we want to get with that. So some of the services you're going to see coming online uh, in the center. Um, expansion of our 24-hour um, access walk-in center. And so we've had some of that with RHA. You're going to see some more of that where they have more robust services and supports um, in the walk-in center. That means you don't need an appointment. Uh, to get services and help, you walk in that door on that day and somebody's going to see you that day. That includes psychiatry. When you talk about a service that is um, uh, pretty low across the state on accessing psych psychiatric care, they will have um, available time um, if for in-person as well as telehealth psychiatry on demand in there so they can help somebody if they're out of their meds or anything else they need to do same day. Um, specialized area uh, for dedicated substance abuse uh, for children and adolescents, like we talked about. It's going to be a separate building out, uh, uh, um, away from the others around that. Uh, we're going to have a peer living room uh, within the facility. Um, for those who don't know what a peer living room is, it's using peer support specialists to basically um, give somebody a chance to drop in. Maybe they're not, they're not ready to gauge quite in for services and treatment, but they know they need a little support. This is an opportunity for them to come in. There's computers in there for them to, you know, look online, look for jobs. There's peer support specialists in there that will help them kind of just sit down with them, develop relations and support with them, really start shorting that course for that, that person. Like, okay, how do you get your life going in the direction uh, that you want to? To be an on-site on pharmacy on there for Medicaid, uh, individuals as well as helping people get access to free medications through, um, through uh, patient assistance programs uh, that drug companies offer. So that's a big deal, right? If you can get treatment and you, you can't afford your meds, it's a big problem, right? It's going to, uh, you know, uh, end up people uh, going to the hospital and other resources when they don't need it. Um, and then uh, the behavioral health urgent care. Uh, another big part of that, the urgent care is a 23-hour chair facility where people can come in. We can stabilize them. We can disposition to them. So if somebody needs to come in and they, they say, oh, you're in crisis, you need to go to a hospital, they can work to disposition that person to a hospital anywhere in North Carolina, or they can disposition them to another detox center anywhere. They can help get them to where they need to go uh, within that 24-hour period within the urgent care. And then lastly, you'll see there are facility-based crisis. They mentioned uh, detox beds and residential will be coming with 16 um, uh, facility-based crisis detox beds for inpatient where somebody can stay up to 14 days. Sometimes they may stay a little longer than that, but 7 to 14 days is, is our average turnaround. And I want Lori to talk a little bit about what we've done to bring some community partners actually into the facility to begin providing services into facilities so we start centralizing that. Laura, you want to talk yeah, a little bit about thanks, that? Yeah, thanks, Donald. So we are really excited, and we've been working in the, over the course of the last year or so to really identify, we developed a survey, identifying how we can provide whole health 
care in this facility. So it was very important that we really started looking at community engagement, doing community presentations for the last year, and really getting not only education and awareness, but seeing what different services and supports can also be co-located in this facility to help support people's needs, not just behavioral health, but health care needs and things like housing, financial. So we have several community partners, seven or eight, who have identified. So NAMI will be co-located. NAMI will have a dedicated office in this space where they can have meetings, but it's one of their, actually the largest offices. So NAMI, we can direct traffic to them. They can do family to family, parent to parent, trainings in that space. We also have um, United Way, and I'm not going to list them all, but just so an example, so United Way and support, so they will be on site several days a week, vocational rehabilitation. We have our public health department partners. We have our social services partners. So we hope to expand that and then really co-locate in the peer living room and offer being able to offer AA and a meetings on site at this space. So I'll turn it right back over to you. Okay. Or are we going to go right to the timeline? Yeah. And yeah. I'll just keep on yeah, going. Yeah, Taylor, so Taylor. the timeline. <laughs> yeah. So I wanted Lori to talk a little bit about the timeline of kind of what's left um, from where we are today uh, till we get to the finish line. So it's yeah, we are moving. Close. You're getting we, close. Oh yeah, we are moving. Um, so as the first couple of pictures depicted, it's been 18 months, and it has been a journey. And I would take, like to take this opportunity to thank the Operations Committee. The Operations Committee has met every other <coughs> week for 18 months. So thank you all so much. Your dedication and your passion has really kept this, kept us moving. And the guidance that, that the operations committee has provided. So we're looking at the first week in May, and I am here to say that inspections have begun. So the city of Burlington has begun to inspecting. We anticipate inspections occurring the first of next week with our certificate of occupancy, certificate of compliance, they call it now. That will allow us to move. We're scheduled to, to actually begin moving furniture next week into the facility. So the facility-based crisis and the behavioral health urgent crisis, those are going to be start moving on May 15th and then May 16th, the office furniture. Mm -hmm. So that will begin where RHA is located now. They will begin to transition Appointments will begin to be scheduled, and once we're actually in the facility, that will kick off the licensure packet and the application for the facility-based crisis piece once we have that. Um, we also anticipate um, the Department of Health Services regulation, the licensing, um, they will also come in. Um, another piece that has to occur is the pharmacy. The pharmacy actually has to reapply and do an application in order to move their medication and open up the pharmacy. So we, that will happen upon the furniture moving. They'll have to transfer that license into the facility. So we have the substance abuse intensive outpatient treatment. That's also a licensure that will have to transition. So those will begin to transition the end of May, beginning of June. And I will kick it back over to Donald. Thank you very much. So a lot of exciting things happen as we wrap it up. The last time I was in uh, this and given a presentation, I had the, the difficult task of telling the commissioner body of inf the inflationary costs that were happening in the facility. Uh, was sheet metal and sheet rock and ceiling materials, everything was going skyrocketing with inflation um, as we was building this uh, building. And it was going to cost us an extra $1.2 million. And we knew that was a challenge. And, and so we we'd committed to the commissioners at that time, we we're going to do everything we can to try to keep costs down, try to get into this facility at a reasonable and the lowest cost possible uh, for the county. And so 
Now I can tell you the good news um, as part of that. Uh, we've uh, worked really hard uh, with the state since then. As you know, the state uh, passed uh, Medicaid uh, expansion in the state. They uh, got roughly a $1.8 billion bonus, I think, from the federal government for that Medicaid expansion. They invested around 800 million of that dollars in North Carolina behavioral health. Um, as part of that, they've committed roughly, I think, 80 million dollars to improving behavioral health crisis services in North Carolina. And so we began having meetings uh, with the state to say, hey, we were doing some really great work in Alamance County. We want you to get behind the work that we're doing in Alamance County, and I am glad uh, to state that the state has awarded us a $4.6 million grant wow. for Alamance County that will not only uh, take care of uh, that cost, uh, that $1.2 million over, but any some of the additional costs uh, that were going into the facility. I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, also, I just wanted to, you know, uh, say briefly, uh, there was nine initial awards that the state put out on that funding uh, that they awarded across the state. Uh, VIA had put in for seven uh, requests across our catchment area. I'm glad to announce that of the nine awarded uh, amounts that the state gave out, VIA was awarded seven of them. So we got seven out of the nine awards uh, for our counties. We're really excited about that. Uh, not only work we're doing here, uh, but in other uh, counties. Um, so, uh, so as of now, uh, the funding that's going in to get this facility opened, you're probably wondering where we're at with that. And so with the $4.6 million, uh, we're working with the counties. If you remember, there was $1.2 million that was committed by Cardinal Innovations for this facility many, many years ago. It's been sitting in a bank account for years now and never operational. Um, so those dollars will now become pulled into the operations as well as the county. You guys work to get in a half a million dollars of estate appropriations uh, two years ago for this facility. And so I'm glad to say that you guys are going to get into this facility with our $4.6 million grant, the $1.2 cardinal money, the $500,000 appropriation, in zero county dollars uh, for this project. So, really excited about that. Hopefully, uh, you guys are excited about that as well uh, within the county. <laughs> so, um, so one of, one of our last hurdles, and definitely want to put this well, on me, your right. Let yes. me enter in. Yes, please. The Baptist said amen. The Presbyterians don't usually do that in the middle, of, but I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Please do. Uh, a lot of prayers are going up all over for us as well, as uh, we know these things are, are easy, are not easy, and, you know, counties really got to step out there when you're making a commitment to do something like this. And you guys uh, took a step out there and said, hey, this is what our community needs in, for our citizens, and you guys took a step out there in faith and in journey with us um, over uh, two years ago, so I'm really glad. This is, uh, out of the, all the centers we built, this is the seventh one I've been involved with in construction and building, and this one has, by and far, you're going to have the best, one of the best facilities in North Carolina, if all on the East Coast, um, at an incredible cost point. I mean, it, it's really, uh, it is remarkable. So, well, it shouldn't go without saying that you've been working with a really good contractor as well. Well, absolutely. Big shout out to Chad Co. He is, uh, they have done a great job and they've been a wonderful partner. So thank you for, for mentioning that. Um, the one remaining uh, issue that we're working on, I call an issue, uh, but I know we'll get there because we have great partners um, in Alamance County, uh, but we're trying to arrange for the security within the facility, right? We got services going in, we got a wonderful facility going there, but we're trying to work through the security. Uh, we've been meeting with the county, all the municipalities for over a year now, uh, talking about, okay, this is where it needs uh, the county and, and some municipalities, some of the challenges are they're having staffing issues across all of their law enforcement bodies. And so, one, they don't have the the staff to the commit that they did at the beginning of this project. And so we've asked them and we've recently, with the county support, we've sent a letter to all the municipalities asking them to um, um, add some funding 
to their budgets that they can contribute funding to the security. And so now we're looking at um, if we cannot get security directly from the sheriffs and the municipalities, whether we look for a private sector um, security company to do that work. And if so, we're looking for the municipalities um, and sheriff's department to help fund some of that. Right now, it's looking like our cost is going to be around $398,000 a year to fund security in that facility. Um, a facility like this isn't required to have security, I'll say that, but it makes a massive difference when you do, right, yes. on, <coughs> on when you can have that. Repeat the number. Uh, $398,000, sorry, um, is what they're looking at for that. Now, again, uh, as we go out to a private sector, it's going to really depend on those bids um, and see what we can get there, as well as the, the type of company uh, we can get. Because we do want, if we go that route, we need to find some place where they do have sworn officers that can do some of that work. Because we can't do IVC, involuntary commitment, exchange of custody, right. without those sworn officers. And so, you know, it does, doesn't help us a lot to have security if they can't really exchange comp uh, uh, custody. Because our goal is, is that your law enforcement comes to the facility, they drop people off, exchange the custody, and they get back out on the streets where, where they're needed, right? We don't want law enforcement sitting in a lobby for an hour or two um, out of their day with somebody when they need to be out on the streets. Let me yes. interrupt there and I apologize. Um, currently, what happens is law enforcement picks up a concerned citizen. Uh, they sit there either in a magistrate's office, they sit in the, at the hospital, they sit somewhere for hours. So this facility will help uh, facilitate that concern among many others and I'm going to encourage this board um, to talk to the sheriff's department they've always been ex you know, really involved and exceptionally uh, just exceptional anyway also this facility is inside the city municipality of the city of Burlington so I, I think uh, we will encourage those two facilities uh, to those two agencies um, to help as much as possible. Uh, you can tell Terry I volunteered you. <laughs> and he'll appreciate that. <laughs> uh, we appreciate that as well. Uh, I, that's our goal really, Terry, is like, hey, we do need some support from the commissioners in really talking to these municipalities. It's one thing for us to be able to talk to the city um, to some of the other municipalities around this. It's another thing. We really think we're going to need commissioner support to really get that across the line to where them, because at their, they're at their budget standpoint now where they've already submitted budgets for the year. We need to get them to reconsider. Hey, I know uh, Sherry Hook uh, has been wonderful. I'll note her. Uh, she's done a wonderful calculation uh, for us as well. Is based on, I think it's based on population. Um, what would be the fair share for the municipality versus the county versus uh, the city in that? I think that's a, a great starting place for us to really talk about um, because this will save um, law enforcement money and time and make their jobs more efficient uh, when they can bring people to the center. It's not only going to help them during that day, it's going to have a long-term effect because if you talk to them, there's probably a handful of people they see over and over and over again. And if we can reduce that time where they have to go out to X residents, 20 calls every month, because we can get that person wrapped and supported in services, it's just gonna really be a huge benefit uh, for them as well. But you gotta get people past seeing, oh, it's gonna, you want us to put 50,000? Well, 50,000 may save you 200,000, but sometimes people don't see it that way. Um, so that's our um, our last hurdle that we're really trying to work through um, and uh, moving forward. That being said, I uh, want to invite you as well as anybody else in this room. Uh, our grand opening is scheduled for June the 19th uh, for 9 uh, to 12 p.m. And so we're really excited about that. Hopefully all of you will be there. Um, to come out and celebrate that with us. As soon as we open up, we are going to immediately be rolling into services. 
Not all services will come online on day one uh, because of the, the licensure rules. We got to get uh, facilities licensed. We don't have full control over that, but trust me, we will be making as many calls as we can uh, to get people to expedite our requests to get uh, these licensure re uh, reviews done as soon as possible um, so we can get those uh, services online for the facility. And so I'll open it up to any questions you have for us. Ms. Thompson. Yeah, you know what I'm thinking. I'm going to go ahead and ask it first. Um, $4.6 million grant and the 500000 and 1.2, there's no room in that money for security? Um, no. Okay. We've, and, and we, I could sit down and show you, we've been, we've been paying on this yeah. uh, facility since we, we got the lease. So there's, there's, we've got about three plus million dollars already that VIA has put into upfront cost gotcha. for this facility that have not been able to be reimbursed. Those are part of the, the conversations with the county are reimbursing that. So basically, we're basically going to reimburse VIA so the county does not have to um, in that. So it's saving the county um, a portion of those costs. Okay. Um, when you talk about security, um, these folks, whoever these folks are, are on these young people, are they don't have a particular street. It's all over the county which means all of our law enforcement covers that at any time. Sometimes they have to work together. So uh, it's kind of really a responsibility of all of us, not just putting it on one particular group, because um, we see how law enforcement is short in their services, everything, EMS, all first responders, even our military recruitment is way down. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's a biggie for me to not do it on. And I want to know who's going to pay for the medication, the pharmacy. That's not CVS setting up in there and right. you pay your cash register. Who's, where's that coming from and how's that going to be paid? Because we can give them that, get them caught up and back on their prescription and get them back on their meds. But when they need that refill, where's that coming from? Is this Medicaid or where is this? Yeah, so Genoa is a, um, a certified Medicaid pharmacist. So Medicaid, if the individual has Medicaid, Medicaid will pick that up. If they have any other commercial insurance, they'll be able to bill that uh, as well in there. Uh, Genoa is also really good at accessing patient assistance programs. So most of the drug companies out there have do patient assistance programs where people can't afford their meds. And so they'll help the individuals apply uh, for those patients' assistance in order to get free access uh, to medications. Okay. I know this is going to be like the mother of all. You're going to be the 911, so to speak, to sending people out where they need to go. And, and every county has a shortage of those places sometimes because um, the more awareness of mental health, the more it opens that barn door, which is a good thing yes. because they'll stay hidden down a long alley, so to speak. Right. Homeless adapt to that, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, help, me to, help me to understand the RHA now compared to how the RHA is going to be there because um, sometimes they go to the hospital, which is that could happen without RHA. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes they're referred to the slight number of folks we have in this county. Um, I had to get somebody to send Freedom House Thursday after celebrate recovery because it didn't work here. Yeah. And I want to mm -hmm. know how that's going to be different with, with the Diversion Center because mm -hmm. even I'm glad to hear the days are longer, not just four to seven. It's longer as far as stay. I mean, Donald, I'm preaching to the choir right here. Those days don't fix this issue. It mm -hmm. stabilizes it. So right. what's that going to look like afterwards? And you talk about we'll get them to where they need to go. Are they going to get in your car and you're going to get them? Because this is a population that might not have a driver's license, certainly don't have a car, might be living not in a home. Yeah. So, I mean, it's a really rough, destitute, dire straight yeah. people that are in this place where we are. So help me understand the difference between RHA now and what RHA is going to be, not just in a big, beautiful building. Yeah. So the, the, the best way I can describe it is RHA right now <clears throat> is a hammer, mm -hmm. and they're fixing all of their problems with the hammer. Okay. Right? <laughs> and in order to really support people, because everyone's very unique and they have their own challenges, very complex individuals, you got to have tools in your toolbox, 
right? And that's where you talk about services like the peer living room or the facility-based crisis or the behavioral urgent care. Those are tools they don't have today, right, within their system. They don't have some of the staffing. Because all these people are going to be in these the same building, there's going to be more physician care in this building. There's going to be more nursing care for medical support within this building. You know, all of these resources are going to be there right now that aren't sitting in the RHA building, right? Like, maybe they're somewhere in the county, but they're actually going to be in this building. NAMI will be, you know, like a critical resource in this. So somebody comes in, they start talking about, hey, you know, the, you know, mom is really struggling. Well, maybe mom don't qualify for services, with RHA, but maybe they can connect mom to NAMI and, and mom can get family to family support, right, in order to support that. But you start integrating some of that in, it doesn't, it's not, it's not the magic solution yeah. to everything, but you are going to make a significantly different impact when you create, give people more opportunities and more tools within there, because as you grow that, you also are able to grow your, your external community system, right? Like, once you identify these people and you know, like, hey, we got all these people that could go on a community support team, which is a community services that drives to people's house and access them. We got 50 people in a community support team. It makes it really easy for a provider to say, yeah, I'll do that if I know there's 50 people I can bill on tomorrow and I'm not going to lose $100,000 starting up a program, right? And once you start identifying the services and support, you're able to start building all of those other tools you need, like a drug treatment court, like a drug treatment court outside of all of these other wraparounds, it really helps some people, but it doesn't connect it. All of these are pieces of the puzzle. They got to fit together nicely uh, within your community. And so this isn't the end all, the be end all. It just becomes a major piece of the puzzle that we got to keep building services and supports around in the county to support people. The last thing I'll say is, uh, via as well as the other uh, Taylor plans go live with Taylor plan July 1st, which is 60 days from now. What I'm really excited about that for us is we take over the medical expenses for people on that, which means that we will be managing people's pharmacy benefits. Um, um, we'll also be managing Medicaid transportation um, across our catchment areas. And so, whereas of now in the county, you'll see people have to take the county transportation system if they want Medicaid. Come July 1st, that opens it up that people can get access to Uber and Lyft, that your local taxi cab company, all of those can be Medicaid transportation providers and they and actually access services in a really um, incredible way. Um, come July 1st. And so that's going to open up tons of doors for this to address people, like you say, have no transportation, they can't get to their appointments. All they're going to have to do now is to schedule the ride in through uh, the rideshare app and taxi cab company or an Uber driver may drive right up to that person's house and pick them up and bring them to the center. One last thing. Um, I went, and I think you and Bill went also, I don't know if you two gentlemen went, to the emergency room. Mm -hmm. um, I talked with Ryan Blackledge because of group home tasks, group homes, especially for young people. They get out of control because they are young people. We don't know the hell they've been raised in. And they drop them off at the ER, mm -hmm. and they're dropped off there. I believe mm -hmm. they're referred to as borders now. That's a popular word nowadays. Mm -hmm. And I visited over there, and I saw all kind of walks of life in this room. And that's not where, that's not what the ER does. The ER is a broken arm, a heart attack, a car wreck, things like that. And they, over and over, I just saw him at the heart and vascular surgery, unbelievable place, uh, grand opening last week, that they're, that's just not what they do. That's, mm -hmm. that's their emergencies. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that's took on a whole new life of its own. How is that gonna be different when this kid has come from a terribly traumatic, abusive lifestyle? He's been brought here from mm -hmm. another county mm -hmm. and he's in a group home and he just loses it and shows out and they take him to the ER and drop him off and he may be there for months. Mm -hmm. How is this going to be different? Only reason I'm asking you this is because I, I want to know because I need that reassurance that we're going to really take care of our young people that are in high trauma risk situations. Mm -hmm. So I won't say I have the magic bullet for all of that because there's a huge gap in foster care in oh, this God. state. Yeah. 
uh, foster parents have left the system in droves right, um, to care for these kids, and so that's a major problem. Uh, residential treatment has shut down their beds because the federal legislation um, has moved away from congregant care for kids, and, and providers see that, so why would you invest millions of dollars to build services you know the federal government's going to shut down at some point, right? And so we, we've sort of left ourselves in this um, deficit um, area in the state. We, we've expanded beds in our areas despite some of that. Uh, the, what I would say is for this, the reason why we put this facility right next to the hospital yeah. is to try to address that, right? If this facility was on the other side of town, it would make it harder. What we, try, what we have to do is this next steps of the community is you got to start thinking about how you change the culture of Alamance County of where people go when they're in crisis. Because right now, that's all they know is to go to that ED. Yeah. And if mom knows or anybody else knows, take your kid to the ED, the group home. Take them to the ED. Part of that is changing that culture is you take them here first. Because that kid can go into this facility. We can see him. We have urgent cares all across our area where they're seeing these kids instead of an ED. And we can disposition them to other facilities that can actually support them, like a child facility-based crisis center, uh, you know, that's around. Um, or, you know, they have one right over in Greensboro, right? That's not full most of the time, I'll say that. Um, and so it's really getting a hold of these, um, those situations before they get into the ED. Because even though you get into the ED and the hospital's like, yeah, we want these people out of here, boy, when you sit down with them, because we have staff in your ED um, at Cone Hospital trying to get those people out, it's not as easy as the doctor signing the release papers and letting that person just walk out the door, right? And so it's, we really got to change the thing of where do they go initially because we can disposition them and get them the, the help they need sooner than trying to continue to, the fight with the hospital system of pulling people out of those levels of care. Well, just to add one last thing, that's why it's so important that eight hours they are in a school, that they have those front services there with school nurses and psychologists and whatever behavioral specialists. That's their first line because that's many times the best eight hours of a kid's day. 100% agree. We are we are very supportive of our school-based system and it's um, state DPI doesn't make that easy either. Yeah. They don't like mixing the water there. So. It's amazing where we send millions when we don't send them right here. Mm -hmm. Done. Sorry, y'all. Yep. I might add, I think the number we got from Nick the last time was about 20% of cone ED space is taken up with borders. Yeah, and there were two seniors in the hall with dementia that had nowhere to go, and they'd been there for weeks. Yeah. I mean, that could be my parent. That could be me one day. You know, you just yeah. have to really think uh, about that. Yeah. And, and I did get a call from Sherry like a week or so ago to check on that. We checked in with them. Um, out of them, they had like two, two people that were actually via... Uh, people there. We immediately got one out, and so at last week we only had one um, over there that was looking to be dispositioned, and like I said, we are the only health plan mm -hmm. that actually has people sitting in your hospital, but you have to remember when the state, what I say, um, diversified their <laughs> Medicaid system is not everyone sitting over there with behavioral health problem belongs to VIA anymore. Oh, is we're only managing roughly about 20% of the Medicaid population. And that's not everyone sitting in ND. There's a lot that belong to Blue Cross Blue Shield mm -hmm. and WellCare and Centene and all of these other health plans that don't have people, that don't have staff sitting in ED, that are not sort of managing that. And so we're working through that as well as how do we support all of that with our counties and, and be there for the hospital systems as well. But we can't also continue to fund, um, we don't get paid by the state to fund people that are not part of our health plan either. So that has caused some challenges. I'm just glad we have VIA. And since day one, I knew I could believe what come out of your mouth. Well, I, appreciate I appreciate that. that. We'll continue to fight to earn that. Mr. Sure. Uh, Donald, thank you very much for your presentation and your work and your, and your folks' work so for, since you guys have been uh, with us, which is one over a couple, three years. Yeah. Um, Couple of quick questions. If I'm somebody who who needs services now, I, I go to Aunt Elizabeth Drive. What day do I no longer go there and I go to this facility? Yeah, do we have that day yet? Yeah, I was going to say probably will be depending on. So, what is the individuals that are currently going to Aunt Elizabeth Drive? Right, they have regular scheduled appointments. Those individuals will begin 
really in two weeks, will begin to get their following appointment at the new site. But if I'm a new person, who but if you're a new person yet, being able just... to walk in, I'm going to say June 1st. June 1st. June 1st. Okay. Yep. Yep. So, and that'll be for outpatient services again. Some of the <laughs> services are going to be dependent on when uh, DHSR actually provides for the, the license. We will make sure that there's plenty of signage at Elizabeth Drive as well. So if somebody shows up there and they're like, hey, the doors are locked, it's not going to be just like, there'll be plenty of signage there telling them where, uh, where the new facility is. Yeah, and, and RHA plans to keep individuals at Anne Elizabeth for a while to be able to support those two sites being available. So if somebody were to walk in at Anne Elizabeth, they're not going to get a closed door. There will somebody be there that will be able to support them. And if they walk into the new Alamance Behavioral Health Center, there will be um, navigators on site as well in order to bridge that transition. Do we know when the lease is up at Anne Elizabeth Drive where you can no longer go there? July. Okay. It's July. So it's the, actually, I believe, the end of July. So okay. there, there will so, be several pretty much the summer. So if you're in the system now... You've got appointments and you'll know where to go. If you're yep. new to the system the, and you're outpatient, you're, June 1st, you're going to go to the new facility, right. and then we'll know that, uh, and there'll be some transition time up until yep. the end of July, and yep. then everybody knows yep. to go to yep. the new. Yep. Okay. No wrong door. Okay. <laughs> the doors will be open at both. Oh. And um, on security, how, how many people at one time do you anticipate needing for security at the new facility? I think we're just looking one person on, at a shift, shift down a time, and we got three shifts, some seven days a week. So yeah. it's like, was that 21 people? I think it's, no, it's eight people. Eight, eight total. Eight FDs. total. Okay, yeah. one at a time, one, one yes. individual. Yes, only one on site, yes. Okay. And in most of our other facilities, I mean, most of the time, you know, we got a lot of, uh, we work with the Sheriff's Department to create, you know, a great security system over there. So there's very... There's not really a nook or cranny in there that doesn't have a camera looking at it that the on-site security can't see what's going on around the whole facility at any time. Yeah, and Burlington Police Department helped design, came in and helped design the placement of the cameras, and I believe there's 64 of them throughout the whole site. So where, where we're really needing security is the Behavioral Health Urgent Care Center. So to help support... Um, there is a parkway here and a security, actually, security access for law enforcement. And then the security officer would be there to greet them, then introduce to the facility and help support that transition to the crisis behavioral health urgent care center piece. That's the main piece. It's not, what we're not looking for is somebody to walk around and, and do you know, like you would at a shopping center where you have security at different posts. This is really related to the urgent care center to make sure we can do those changes of custody and make sure it's, there's a safety element there. Peace. Um, does that answer your question? Thank you. Mr. Carter. You, you were talking about um, making presentations to inform people around the county of, of what's going on. Can you give me some examples of where you made some of those presentations? Sure. What kind of groups? Sure, we've done quite a few of them. So the United Way has a forum that they do bi-monthly, monthly, um, that they bring all of the non-for-profits together. So we have presented there. We have also done one-on-one -on -one presentations related to um, vocational rehabilitation. We did one for NAMI. We have done one for um, different parts of school counselors. Um, you name it. We have just been like every place. And what we decided to do was use a standardized slide deck that listed out all the components of, we broke down the elements. It wouldn't even call the elements behavioral health center there when we <laughs> developed that slide deck. We, it was just the new diversion center. Um, and broke out the components and then went through the planning of each components and then the projected potential time frame 
explain to the audience too, please, who NAMI is. So they're the National Alliance for Mentally Ill, um, and so they do a wonderful work uh, with uh, families and and uh, directly with individuals as well. And so they, they actually do trainings and, as well as direct supports uh, with individuals through NAMI. And so we actually have NAMI co-located at our diversion center uh, in Buncombe County, and it's, it's just been an, an incredible partnership. Um, on engaging that support in the facility, their volunteers on helping families that come in <coughs> in crisis, right? Like to have somebody else that's um, walking that journey with them to come out to the lobby and sit down with them and actually talk to them about, hey, you know, my son or my daughter or my cousin, you know, uh, was sitting in this center two years ago and, you know, had these experiences and this is where they're at now sometimes is is very powerful. Yeah. So yeah, having them there. And I'll say, uh, I'll be amiss to uh, recognize uh, Kara. Um, Kara's here today. She's with our community relations director. You guys know her well. Uh, but this is this is an ongoing process, right? So Kara's going to be. Stand up, so. Oh, yeah, stand up, Kara. <laughs> Hi, thank you. <laughs> so this will be an ongoing process. We're not going to just talk with your community once. It's going to be ongoing looking for opportunities to sit down with groups across the county talking to them about the center, developing this out. Um, in other communities, we're sitting down with law enforcement on a regular basis, right? Because their turnover with new officers is quite, you know, substantial in some areas, right? And so you got to retrain and you got to talk about crisis intervention training and all these other supports because sometimes they're like, it's so easy just to go to the, hosp to the hospital, right? That's, we really want to train them differently and, and with that. So this will be an ongoing process with us and your community and you guys for years and years to come, really just continuing to educate, train people. You know, you may see some billboards go up. You know, we're going to do some marketing, you know, in the paper and, you know, hopefully on the televisions and really just try to get that word out there. Well, I might encourage you too. Um, you have organizations like Rotary, <laughs> Civitans, uh, JCs. Lions, uh, different groups around the county, great locations to get out for a lunch, breakfast, dinner meeting, or whatever, and make a presentation and spread the message. Yeah, we'll, we'll go anywhere for lunch. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I just want to acknowledge Bob Crichton's a strong NAMI advocate in the back room. He does great Bob. work with ICE. Absolutely. Yeah, and he's been a central component of our operations committee. Um, I've known him since he's six. If you want to know anything, just ask him. <laughs> uh oh, Bob. <laughs> uh oh. It might indicate that Bob and I and Bill Lashley are all three on your regional board, mm -hmm. and I'm on your statewide board. So, so you get to see behind the curtain of all the hard work we're trying to do to exactly. fix some of these uh, issues across the state. So we appreciate your support there too. Uh, any I mean, other questions for yes. us? Yes. Um, this new facility separates juveniles from the adults. Uh, give us a, just a little highlight there. Yeah, so you'll see, I don't know if you could probably see it in the rendering in this picture, but in the rendering you'll see it's kind of an L-shaped building. Yeah, right there. Thank you for doing that. Mm -hmm. On the right-hand side of the building there, that section over there is a separated section, specifically just for children and families. And so... Children and family are not going to have to go right into the middle of, you know, a center where there's potentially some crises going on or some challenges going on or, you know, seeing law enforcement working with somebody uh, in there. It's going to be off to the side to be able to get their services and supports there, wrap around. It's right next to the pharmacy, so it's a much more calming. They've designed the space, and you'll get to see that um, when you come over. Hopefully, they're ready to come over for the ribbon cutting or the uh, grand opening, um, and that's designed specifically for children in a really uh, nice environment there. Um, it doesn't have an on-site uh, uh, all the kids can be managed to be able to urgent care, but the long-term beds, those are adult beds. And so if a kid does need uh, like a residential stay, we'll have to be dis we'll have to disposition them to other facilities. And I was had the honor of touring the building a couple of weeks ago. Uh, phenomenal. Mm -hmm. have, for adults and children, you have different entrances, different really buildings. Mm -hmm. and so forth, so they are truly separated, uh, and I think that's wonderful. Uh, the location, all of us know where it is, 
But if you go like you're going to ARMC, make the left-hand turn at the traffic light just before you get to that entrance, that takes you behind IHOP and then you make a right-hand turn at the new traffic circle, right, um, right. and it's the building right there on the corner. I would encourage everybody, if nothing else, to drive by and look at it. Mm -hmm. It's impressive, interior and exterior. Mm -hmm. um, and I particularly want to thank you guys and the young lady that didn't want to stand and I yeah. talk her. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and Chad Porterfield, the owner of Chad Co., uh, just so many, and Bob, and so many different partners that have worked long and hard. Uh, when we left Cardinal and went to Maya, that was one of the major accomplishments for me as a commissioner uh, being on this board. Uh, you guys have done such a positive job and influence for this county. And we really appreciate the stepped up basis that you guys have continued to give this county. Well, we appreciate it. Again, it's just one piece of the puzzle, but we're going to keep um, sticking with you. And hopefully we can help you guys with the drug court and all the other pieces that make up that picture. So thank you for that. And ribbon cutting June 19th. So June 19th. Everybody be there. Yeah. Be there, be square, right? That's right. Okay. We'll eat at Ha Ha. <laughs> we thank you. Okay, thank you very much. How's it doing well? You need a break? We're going to take a five-minute recess. Okay, we've, uh, we're going to take a uh, five- to ten-minute recess, hopefully five. Um, before you, the first item that I have for your review um, is the resolution which will authorize the issuance of our general obligation bonds. Uh, if the board will remember, back in 2018, voters approved a $150 million bond resolution for the for the school system as well as $39.6 million for ACC. Uh, we have issued those bonds and are now bringing before the commissioners the ability to issue the last little piece that has been authorized but unissued of $19,515,000. I um, want to kind of walk through what those projects are going to be for. Um, you know, we had a consolidated roof and HVAC study that the county performed. This will address the top priorities of that first list of HVAC and um, roof needs. So the process that we have followed is the board gave staff the ability to proceed and we have met with LGC, we have had our rating agency calls and I am pleased to report that from Standard & Poor's and Moody's we received our results and both entities have upgraded the county. Um, so now with Standard & Poor's, we are at a double-A plus, and with Moody's, we are at a double-A one. Um, so that will help us with the interest rates that we receive, but I want to thank management staff um, for those creating rating agency calls, as well as the policies that the board has put in place. And also that has to do with the amount that we have reserved. Mm -hmm. Does that not help us? That is true. Um, one thing that they look at is our ability to pay back that debt as well as what we have in our capital reserves and general fund balance as well. So the last item that I have for you um, for that process for us to be able to actually issue those bond is a resolution that will authorize the county to move forward. So Commissioner Paisley, if I could have you introduce that resolution by reading the title only, please. All right, um, and I will make this motion that we adopt this resolution. This res resolution authorizing the issuance of the general obligation school bonds series 2024. I'll second that. That's correct. And in our packet and online and so forth, you have a copy of the resolution itself. Any discussion, board? Just a couple of questions, if I yes. may, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Evans, when, mm -hmm. uh, if this is approved, when do we actually have the money in here? So we will actually go to bond market on May 29th, and upon a successful sale, then we will close on those bonds and have funds in hand uh, June 18th. 
we need to. And is there a is there a plan for the spin for these uh, on the projects that have been identified? Yes. So this will address those top uh, uh, priority that were identified for the roof and the HVAC projects. I believe we showed that to you all a couple of commissioners meetings ago. Those projects roughly total about $21 million. And what happens to the money when the county gets it? Does it does it stay with the county? Does it go to ABSS? What happens to the money? So the cash will stay with the county um, and we will have an agreement with the school system for our 2021 bond sale. Basically what we did is entered into a lease agreement with the school system to where they are leasing the facilities from the county so that we can pay those invoices directly to the vendors. This helps us utilize um, and maximize the sales tax refund so that we can stretch those bond dollars to cover as much of those projects costs as we can. Um, so we are not working on a reimbursement to the, to the school system, but the county in turn will receive those invoices once school system staff has identified that the project and the work has been completed to support that invoice and then we pay from there. So I, I didn't I didn't understand this. We're leasing the facility? So it's a it's in word only that they are leasing the school facilities from the county so that what that allows us to do is so on a contractor statement there is sales tax that can be claimed for reimbursement for a refund back to the county. If the school system is paying that they're only applicable to the 2% local. If the county is paying it, then we're, we are able to get the entire amount in refund. So what we do is we pay that from a general fund liability account, which then has the net coming from the bond proceeds that we're able to strengthen those dollars and keep that funding as much as we can. Okay. Uh, to but, maximize the but costs. But just so I'm clear, the, the deeds for the properties that or ABSS school Still ABSS. Or ABSS. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes. It's through that lease agreement. Is there a uh, is there a, a plan to get contracts approved to maximize the, uh, to be efficient so that as soon as we have this money, we've got projects moving? I mean, we'll have money in hand on June 18th. Are there yeah, contracts so that are, are we leading that process so that we, and when I say we, I guess, I mean the school system. Are right. they leading the process so that they have business in hand to to begin so that we can do some of this heavy work over the summer where kids are not in school? They are. They're, the school system is preparing uh, for how to spend this money, and we're having meetings with them on a regular basis. It, it is obviously their, their discretion and their processes that are going to guide this, but what we've asked the school system to do is to lay out a schedule for how and when this money is going to get spent and to submit that to us. We discussed that. We haven't finalized that list yet, haven't haven't gotten there yet. That's something I'm working with Greg Hook on. To let's have a schedule of when these things are going to get done so that we have some transparency and we can assure things are moving. When do we anticipate having from the school system that schedule that you've requested? I think it's reasonable to have that by the time the money comes in, in the middle of June. I might also indicate that the Oversight Committee uh, worked with Mr. Baker, who those of you on broadcast land, uh, Yvonne Baker uh, is overseeing that as an assistant county manager. Uh, and so that's in process. Um, well, I would just, I mean, to sum it up, I just want to make sure that I mean, there's going to be money in hand <clears throat> and, school, and kids out of schools. Uh, I would hope that, that they can work in these next you know, 60 days to, well, less than, less than that, to prime that process so that we're ready to go. Um, that seems to be the most efficient way to, to do that. I, I suppose you, you could say that you know, they're waiting for this vote, but right. I, I think that's likely. I, so. I mean, just from an expectation standpoint, all the roofs need to be engineered and then started construction. The HVACs um, are less of a two-step process right. they don't have to be a two-step process right. but the lag time between figuring out the equipment you need ordering it and getting it installed it's unlikely to be a summer project for these okay. things to be done this summer um it might also indicate that some of the hvc hvc uh, vac systems are being removed from roofs that are being re-roofed and that also 
is a time complication. It, it may be that there are things that require leave time in engineering. It may be that there are other projects where a quick you can get a quick hit with some new HVAC. Yeah, I think perhaps there, those would be if there's off the shelf to, solutions available to us. I think that's something they can jump on. Yeah. I think the general consensus you're getting from probably all of us is the old get her done. We're we're tired of seeing money sitting around for at ABSS for for their projects for up to two or three years. Let's get this stuff done and don't come back and point a finger at us and say we didn't do it when it's been funded. Um, at the meeting last week, it was um, mentioned by Greg. He did. He, they're just they lay it out really easy. But if you're not there, it's different online. It's different in the newspaper. It's just different. And they were real quick because some of their board members weren't sure about because um, they'd had multiple folks to email them like we have about getting this done, getting this all done. And it just takes a great deal of patience when you're working with stuff this big. It didn't like our home. And, um, and Greg was real quick to point out that Brian was all over this with the engineers and the walking and all that. And, um, and I know the oversight committee is, is very, very important, but um, I would really like to request that our board and their board meet in that same fashion with this oversight because I think the more informed, the, one, the ones of us don't attend this meeting and the ones of them, they got seven, we got five, mm -hmm. to really help to understand exactly what is going on because um, hearsay will get you in jail. <laughs> I mean, it's just, we just really need to be at the same table at the same time in the same room, kind of like when we did the mold stuff. You know, we, we're all hearing it at the same time and seeing it at the same time. So, um, Chairman, I hope that's something we could really do because I think their board members are probably just as frustrated as we are when it comes to not things getting done fast enough. But we got they got DPI. That's another whole monster in itself, red tape. So, but still, um, all this money, we got to really move and get stuff done because we're looking at big time budgets and things. So just, just a suggestion. Yeah, I really appreciate that. Uh, to address part of that, and I think you're dead on the money, uh, we were having monthly meetings at a minimum. Uh, the superintendent, uh, the county manager, myself as chair of the county commissioners, and the chair of the school board. And the school board uh, terminated that some time ago. And I'm asking and today begging that we resume that as well, because a lot of things can be brought up discuss. Yeah, I talk to my board on a regular basis mm -hmm. and you guys give me your concerns and so forth, but in a small crowd, we sometimes can push things a little harder uh, than a larger committee like the Oversight mm -hmm. Committee. Well, Dan Engel made a good point, too. Um, he was talking about when he and I were chairmen, um, and you were here, and you remember this, and you may have the copy. I made this really tacky invitation with some, <laughs> an apple and a bus from Hobby Lobby and did not tell the superintendent I put his cell phone inside of it and said, can we all just get on a bus and go look at our buildings? Because reading a cost report can really tick you off when you would see all the zeros, but when you see the whole IT whatever behind a third grade class door, or you see water come, it's just, you know, you need to really see it and smell it. You remember the critter at, um, what is it, Andrews, sitting underneath the stoop, looked right at me in the face, and they had to catch him. But what under, The critter lived underneath <clears throat> one of the walkways yeah. into the building. And there's always that third grade <laughs> Rambo wannabe kid that I'll get him. But anyway, um, <laughs> and we all got together. Some commissioners didn't go, the majority did, the board went. And um, we went and we formed teams and we walked the schools. We had community folks too. And that was a task force that eventually led to the school bond because it's, it's really easy to see money and just think, God, what do they do with it? But when you walk in a building and you actually see all the stuff that's wrong mm -hmm. in every building, your church, your house, it's just a lot different. So, you know, they Dan talked about maybe possibly, because Dr. Harrison was here, starting another task force to really, what we've done so far, to go look and, and um, see what we still need to do instead of one side getting mad about the other, who's going to get this done first, because it's all on us. It's all our responsibility, both of us. And, um, and I just think that the more 
Listen, I had to put the school board in a van one time and go to a district meeting because they didn't get along when I was district, district what we call it, chairman, and Bill drove. And I thought, if I can get you all in a white maintenance van and take you out of town, you're going to have to talk to each other. And it worked. So um, if we can just um, look at what we're really facing and figure out what we really need to do with it and not be afraid to fix it, I think we're gonna, this county's going to really rally behind everybody. But that's just a suggestion about us all getting together. I hate we only meet once a year, like with Amy and Dennis and Steve, that. I think the more we can meet as a group, the more reason we can have not to fuss about each other because we're actually there. <laughs> that easily works. Ms. Turner, will you yeah, add additional questions? No, thank you. You're getting a white maintenance family, won't you? Yeah. <laughs> I'll get a coffee. <laughs> Mr. Carter. I think it's a good idea maybe for us to get do a joint another joint meeting, take a look at what, what the need, make sure we're covering all the bases. We all have so many meetings. I don't want to have extra boards, extra meetings, whatever, unless it's really yeah. necessary. I do not want to slow this process down. Right. I don't want to expedite it. Um, and I agree with Mr. Turner. As soon as that money is available, they need to be moving. Mm -hmm. I understand uh, from Mr. Baker that there are requirements. For example, you have to have the engineers on the school. But the school board, that's all on the school board's end of the issue. Uh, we provide the money as of that date in June when the monies are available, we're ready to move. We have to approve the expenditures um, that ought to come before us. But uh, And we, I think as a board, will expedite that as much as possible. Um, but Mr. Baker, I would really encourage you to push as hard and as fast as you possibly can. Any other comments? We have a motion on the table, we have a, a motion and a second. All in favor of this resolution, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Unanimous. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Commissioners. And you don't get to leave. I don't get to leave. I get to stay <laughs> here with you all for just a few more minutes. Um, so the next item that I have for your consideration is for us to um, budget $15,370.64 from the school's capital reserve fund to the school's capital project fund. And this is to complete the Hall River Masonry uh, project. What happened there was there was a miscommunication and a timing issue from when we submitted the budget amendment to close out that project. There was still one outstanding invoice for $15,370.64. So what this amendment will, amendment will allow us to do is to budget those funds back so that we are in compliance with state statute. I cannot pay for a reimbursement if we don't have budget there. So this will budget those funds. We will reimburse ABSS the $15,370.64 for the to finish and complete the Hall River elementary masonry project and those funds are paid out of their capital fund not their current expense which is their operational fund all right and again this is basically just a uh, bookkeeping error not yes, error sir. even uh, but correction uh, it doesn't cost the county a penny we already have the money that's it's correct. simply paying a bill which we didn't have when we thought we had that's correct sir okay Motion to approve. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Unanimous. Thank you. You get to sit down? No. Not yet. <laughs> this will be the last item and then I can return to my seat. Uh, so at the last board meeting when we were talking through our CIP work session, um, the re the question was raised, could the county essentially basically fund through a financing to our own selves for the CAD and the emergency radio? So I wanted to bring back that presentation today, commissioners. Um, so from the CIP work session, we discussed that with the CAD software purchase would total about $5.1 and we were looking at a five-year financing term. 
With our emergency radio purchases, it's a $5 million project and we would look at seven years. The difference of those terms is through, due to the useful life of the projects. So at our assumptions for the CIP is a 5% interest and in that we would have level debt service payments. So on the screen now you can see our current model, which in essence we would have an estimated principal of $10.2 million, estimated interest cost of $2.1 million so that we would have projected debt service payments of $12.3 million. This would include a one-time interest payment for fiscal year 24-25, and then we would see the entire debt service interest and principal in fiscal year 26 moving forward of $2 million. So a future, future potential tax increase needed would be 0 0.82 cents of a penny. So not 0 0.82 cents, but that portion of a penny. So if the county were to fund balance, purchase it, and in essence, finance it ourselves. Over the cost of the years, in fiscal year 25, we would have a CAD payment of $1 million, radios $723,000, which would be then an estimated debt service of $1.7 million. For us to start paying ourselves back in that year, we would need 0.7 of a penny and we would need to maintain that increase through fiscal year 29. In fiscal year, 23, in fiscal year 2030, then we could reduce the impact that would be needed to 0.29 cents of a penny because we would have in essence paid back CAD, assuming those same uh, terms. So then we need to look at, well, what happens to our fund balance impact? Based on our 22-23 audit, the county had an unassigned fund balance of $46.7 million. When we look at our expenditures of that same fiscal audited period of $196.8 million, when you calculate the unassigned fund balance, that percentage brings us to 23.8%. And that calculation is just taking the unassigned portion of fund balance and dividing it by our annual expenditures. And that's one of the things that helped us get an increase in our bond. That's rate. correct. That's correct is our fund balance percentage in our balances. Yes, sir. I have to make that point since Bill's not here this morning. <laughs> he will appreciate that. Yes. It might indicate that Bill Ashley is the one that um, suggested at least looking at this possibility. Mm -hmm. That is correct. Steve's saying it was him. But <laughs> one of the two. That is both. great. So with our current fiscal policy, um, the county has basically kind of like the requirement to maintain at least 20% of our general fund expenditures. Um, so at fiscal year 22-23, we were at 23.8%. Um, so when we have the events where there is that difference and that percentage is above that 20%, the board has the cap capability then to direct staff to transfer those funds to a capital reserve fund or a capital project fund. Um, and if the board will remember, that's exactly what we did this fiscal year. So with our unassigned fund balance of $46.7 million, the board approved a transfer to capital reserve of $7.3 million. This now results in a calculated form uh, fund balance. And I will say calculated fund balance is my term. Um, because your fund balance does not change until your fiscal year is closed. So we won't see that true impact to our fund balance until all the numbers have stopped moving for 23-24. But if we're looking at where we were in 23, how does that how does that align? That's where I'm calling calculated fund balance. So that is just my terminology. Um, so by transferring that $7.3 million, our calculated fund balance is 39.3 million. So when you take that figure and still divide it by our $196 million expenditures, our fund balance percentage still equated to 20%. So if we take that calculated fund balance of $39.3 million and we pay for the CADs, we pay for the radio purchases, that would bring our fund balance down to $29.1 million. Um, Based on some early estimated projections of where I think we will end up in fiscal year 23, 24, 
we would have expenditures of $206 million. When you take that figure and divide the 29.1 by that $206.8 million, that gets our fund balance percentage to 14.1%. That is still within our policy because the board has also the authority from time to time to utilize fund balances that would allow that fund balance to be reduced below that 20% minimum. However, within our policy, we would also have to adopt a plan that would then get those funds back within 36 months. So if we were to look at a 36 month repayment plan, CAD software, we would look at an annual repayment of $1.7 million. For the emergency radio purchase, we would have an annual payment of 1.6, adding those two together, 3.4 million. So we would need an increase of 1.36 cents in fiscal year 23, I'm sorry, in fiscal year 24-25 for this to, to be accomplished. Mr. Turner. Thank you. You're welcome. Was that your comment? <laughs> <laughs> it was actually a question. <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Uh, Ms. Thompson. Uh -uh. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Carter. Just thinking. Um, well, I think I asked us to take a look at this, and, uh, or, and, and Bill may have supported me, or he may have asked and I supported him. I can't remember exactly right now. But anyway, um, it looked like a good idea on the front end. I'm not sure I like it as much now as I, I did then. Yeah. So, It's the impact to the fund balance. That would be my main concern. Right. Let me join Mr. Carter in having reservations. 14.1 um, versus 20 would adversely, in my opinion, mm -hmm. in my undergrad prior to law school, was business and accounting. Yeah. Uh, so I have some idea, as Bill does. Uh, I just don't like us dropping to 14%. Mm -hmm. It will have mm -hmm. a negative impact upon our ability to borrow monies and to do business in the future. So I'm going to uh, say we need to actually finance these two purchases. Well, in addition to that, I don't know that from what I'm seeing on our projections, on our, uh, uh, the running numbers on our sales tax revenues, doesn't look like we're going to see a big contribution to the fund balance this year as we saw last year. I agree with that statement. So, board, are we in a position to ask staff to look into the of borrowing these funds in the near future? Are we not looking at that as making that decision as part of the budget? I'm sure yes. we will. Yes, yeah. we will. Yes. Yeah, right. I, think we, I think the administration is asking for is some direction. I don't think we need to ask for a vote. No the vote is needed today, no. Commissioner Paisley. This was just informational information to the board to let you all see what would happen to fund balance if the county were to try to finance it and repay ourselves. This is the impact. Right. And we're also but, looking at some other, the administration's right. also looking at some other sources of funding mm -hmm. outside of financing. Correct. So. But as the county manager's putting together the annual budget, I think it behooves us to give her some indication as to what our intention is as to this issue. The way that this is currently proposed is within your capital improvement plan as an installment financing. Mm -hmm. So unless there's a reverse of that recommendation, that will remain and then you'll have the opportunity to vote on that during yeah. the budget adoption process. I think we're saying the same thing. Yep. <laughs> mm -hmm. we are. Any other questions or comments? You, you, you did okay till you got to that last line. Uh-uh. <laughs> 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 okay. Ms. Evans, thank That's you. That's it. Thank you. Candy manager. Uh, I don't have much to report. I just wanted to congratulate everyone on the bond rating upgrade. That is a big deal for counties. This is the highest bond rating that Alamance County has ever had. So... 
kudos to Susan Evans as our finance That's director right. and the board for sticking to the policy and making sound fiscal decisions. And we thank all of you guys. I'll be curious to see where we rank. I, have, I don't remember looking for that in this um, county maps book, but I'd be curious to see where we rank bond rating wise to the other counties. A lot of big counties around us are triple A. We're not quite there yet, but right. we're moving in the right direction. Okay. County Commissioner, Ms. Thompson, do you want to go first? Okay. Um, just at the um, school board meeting last week uh, with Dr. Harrison, I've worked with him before. Um, he, he knows what he's doing for sure. Um, they're looking at seven and a half million dollars in additional cuts to get to zero to start over. He's talked about probably in maybe three years they would be back where they need to be. And I, I know that sounds good fiscally, but those three years are going to have a lot of things that kids won't have that will be removed from them. That, that Looking at graduation coaches is one of them. And I, I know for a fact how well that worked. Michael Lane used to be what's after graduation to really pull some of these kids across the line that just had stuff going on that just was not gonna, not gonna make it and um, for whatever reasons, not their intellect, but other reasons. And um, I mean, every, like school nurses, um, counselors, behavior specialists, all kind of stuff. And you know, we, we, we see different schools and some need them, some don't, whatever. But um, the, the thing about, that, that gets me is this, and, and I used to call her the COVID fairy. <laughs> And, and, and she's got a cousin named Esser. And all this money was just like this massive carrot dangled in front of everybody's eyes. And it was like, God, we can get this, we can get that. County, city, schools, name it, whatever it went into. And, um, and it, it seems like it's put us in a situation because um, the schools, the counties, we got folks additional salaries, additional bonuses, all kind of stuff like that, that was just great at the time. But when it comes time when, you know, she's off her broom and she's not going to be riding at the end of this September, you, we got to come back and go, well, we appreciate all y'all, but now we can't have you. And it just really keeps the county, it keeps the families, it keeps everybody on an emotional roller coaster as, well, this really worked for my kid, and now what am I going to do? We saw the, the concerns with the virtual school. We saw, we've saw concerns with everything that um, children have found a place where it worked for them and their families. You know, school is different for every address. I mean, we've got charter, private, Christian, uh, Montessori, public, everything. And the point is everybody, the family, kid, and teacher do their part. And I don't care where you are, if that happens, you will be successful. And that don't always happen. And, uh, but, you know, I just look at all this funding and all this money, and, um, and no matter what it is, it still seems like there are going to be kids that are going to kind of do without them some things. You know, federal will be, me and Patsy Simpson used to try our best to get our hands on that food services money to see if we could help with laptops or books or stuff like that, but you can't touch it because it's federal. And, um, and every federal dollar has this massive string attached to it, and that's why you are told how many grams of fat and salt and sugar you will have in your food. So it's, it's a control thing, and we see it. Because I used to say, if those folks in Washington think their kids are going to eat that food and not go home and immediately open up that refrigerator and start getting everything they can, my son would do that. You know, we just need to realize that everybody just in a piece of paper and a product. And so um, I, I just really want us to think about this. we got a lot of things we're looking at. Our world is looking at, golly, the stuff we're doing for other countries, and I, I look at what we've got here on our own streets that we need to really help with, but we also need to do our part, and what she was talking about, and John, you mentioned it too, and it's, it's the same principle with addiction. You know, um, at any minute you can fall out of that, but any minute you can beat it. It's up to you, but you have to have a support system around you. You just can't beat it by yourself. And um, so I just really want us to think about the things we've heard about our schools and the needs and. And the, the mold, God, it's just really done a number on that. And that mold's been around for a long time. It, ju it just has. And we just going to have to get accept that and realize we've got to take that next step forward and make this right, whatever that looks like. But um, I, what I'm trying to tell you is the adults make all the decisions and the kids wear those decisions. And I just um, hope we really make the right decisions for our children because they are going to grow up and they're going to be in a position to lead. I don't know if you've been watching TV and all the protests on all these college campuses 
across this country. And I had a gentleman from the hospital that I met when was talking mental health, and he looked at me and said, Pam, why are they so angry? Why are they so easily sucked into something that I saw two girls interview said, well, I don't even know what Hamas is. I don't even know what they're doing. We're just here. You know, well, you're just here is very disruptive. And canceling <laughs> graduations when USC has an endowment of six, seven point six billion, and they weren't man enough to have their graduation. I have issues with that. That's poor leadership. And so, but I just want us to really think about the kids and get all the, the adults you know, we, we got to do better. We got to do better because people did better for us and when we were growing up. And we got to do better for them because they do grow up. And, um, and I just I appreciate everything that we can do, everything that they can do. I watched Greg Hook really put Brian in a, such a positive light and the commissioners in such a positive light about the, the engineer and all this stuff. And it's a really good sign of working together. And that's why John, I mentioned about us really, the whole team's working together. Because if we're all there, we're all accountable at the same time and we'll have to just work through it. So um, and that's it, but you just look around the world and you see just crazy. And I don't want crazy here. We deserve better than that. And that's, that's it. I just have a couple questions. Um, Ms. Short, the, um, we've talked about this at the past couple meetings, but the Medicaid hold harmless yeah. payments that the county has gotten in the past, we are, we are under our projection for this year's Medicaid hold harmless payment. Right, we're coming up about $3 million short of what we had budgeted to receive on Medicaid hold harmless this year. When we get what we, what we're actually, we're gonna get about 600,000? Mm -hmm. Yes, that's right. Yes. Okay, is that is that is it closer to two and a half then? Or is it, do we budget? Yes, two and a half. Two and a half? Yep. Do, so there's a two and a half million dollar revenue shortfall, which means we either need additional revenues from other sources or we need not to spend what we've allotted in order to balance the budget. So how concerned should we be about this? Do we need to address spending in the last months of the budget or of the year? How does that impact what we're looking at? Do you want to hit that one? <laughs> we, I'll, we, this I'll one. say that we keep saying it's not a spending challenge, it's a revenue yeah. challenge that yeah. we're facing as we head into next year's budget with this Medicaid revenue and sales tax both lagging. Okay. So yeah. that's kind of like I pushed her. I did not shove her. Sort of, kind of. No. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No. Uh, so what I would say to, to that question, Commissioner Turner, is that even though, yes, we are seeing those decreases in that sales tax Medicaid hold harmless projection that we were anticipating, there have been some other expenses that have also been reduced. It's still a little mm -hmm. too early to make those um, decisions to stop spending. I think spending will be fine through the end of the fiscal year. There are other revenues that have come in slightly higher. So I think at the end, when all the dust settles, we'll pretty much even out. Um, I will say that because we did not continue to push the sales tax budget for mm -hmm. fiscal year 23-24, um, that, that is going to help us as well. All right. All right. Okay, thank you. Uh, and then a, a question about going forward, just the, the, what, what the public can expect in terms of the budget process. Next meeting is you present the manager's recommended? That's right. At your next board meeting, there'll be a manager's recommended budget. The next regular scheduled commissioner meeting will be the public hearing, an opportunity for the public to come and voice their concerns or uh, let, the, let the board know what's important to them. And then typically we set up about three budget work sessions. That's an opportunity for uh, commissioners to take a little deeper dive into some of the recommendations, hear from um, any topics that you'd like more information on, whether that's the education partners or specific county departments, we'll work through those uh, questions that the board might have and any adjustments that you would like to then make. We'll do those during the work session to bring you back at your second June meeting 
uh, a budget that reflects the board's priorities that you'll then adopt for the fiscal year. And those work sessions so we can are bring optional. Different departments in front of us right. at that point. Yeah, you'll let me know as we start talking about the budget where you would like more information, and we'll make sure. And those uh, the work sessions are, are optional. They may happen. They may not happen. Sure. Are they already on the schedule or no? When I sit down with each of you individually, we'll look at your calendars and try to figure out three dates. If you need all three, we'll have them scheduled. If there's not a lot of adjustments or not a lot of um, questions and concerns, then we may not need all three. And I can't remember last year, did those meetings happen before? Was one before the public <clears throat> hearing and the other two were after? I can't remember. I can't remember, but I think we had sort of agreed that all of the work sessions should be after the public hearing okay. so that you're not making changes prior to the uh, residents having a chance to voice their concerns. So we won't start those work sessions until you've heard from the public. And that was the case last year. I think that's what we did last yeah. year as well. And and we don't have yet ABSS's recommendation. I have a recommendation from them. I believe it has not been voted on by the board, so it's it's not an official request. Okay. But I did share the recommendation that was presented last week um, by the superintendent to his board. And if they vote on when is the next? Will they will they present to you the board approved budget before or after our next meeting? Uh, well, May the eleventh is their next meeting, and I think that's when they vote on their proposed budget. Okay. Dr. Harrison has told me I would have something he thinks by the 14th. Yeah. They're required by statute to have that by the 15th of May. Um, when is it? When is our next meeting? Our meeting is the 20th. Okay. So, <laughs> seeing that that is one of the larger portions of the county budget, that is putting a real challenge <laughs> on the plates to try to figure out how to fund them and pull together a budget in a very short period of time. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Carter. I, I, I know we've all been getting, a, 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 as of late last week, a, a, a number of emails concerning a comprehensive study of the school system. And I kind of feel like, it, it, I, I don't know how much deeper we can run the microscope into the school system right Seneca now. Seneca mentioned that, and then Greg took that. Beg your pardon? Seneca mentioned that, because he must have got the same thing this comprehensive thing and Greg Hook took that and brought Brian and all the engineering and what the county's doing so he kind of cleared that up for them okay and I might mention this to so that item Mr. Carter uh, many 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 of the emails I'm receiving on the county commissioner's site uh, are word for word oh, yeah. somebody did Cut a print and out and now we're getting just different signatures, and, and so it's the same letter, word for word. Oh, yeah. It's identical. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry. Continue. That's what I, that's what I was going to say. It's the same letter, but I didn't know what generated whether the school system was trying to push something on us mm -hmm. or what. But I, mean, I, I'm not sure. I don't think we're not trying to look at the facilities. Um, and thank you for the clarification. I think when they hear cuts, and all kind of possible things like that because of funding, like local dollars. ABSS has always been so good about adding the extra from their fund balance, like additional assistant principals, art, music, t that kind of stuff. And, uh, and that's in jeopardy now uh, because the state allots so much per number per position. And, um, and I, <coughs> that, that is every year. For eight years I saw this and, and now for the fourth year, it's just fear because um, it affects them and they're just needing an explanation to figure out how to do this. And this email that we got was connected because like I said, Seneca mentioned that and I thought I got that same email. And then Greg and Bill talked, Dr. Harrison, sorry, talked about it and they spoke so highly of you. And anyway, that Brian Baker is just walks on that water. And so but anyway, I mean, it really showed how folks at that group have been working together and communicating so but it's just that's just fear that's all that is mm -hmm. um it's like a tornado drill we're gonna have it or not you know it's just it's fear fear is powerful especially when it comes to your children okay. are you saying scare tactic 
on the part of the ABSS? No, 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 I don't. This was an ABSS. I think this is just a, a group of family members or, or folks in the community that I don't know, John. I just know, like you said, it was a copy and paste email. I've had them for years, over and over, and um, and they sent it, and and um, and that's that's advocacy in a way that that's their advocacy. But Greg Hook talked about it and reassured and done that kind of thing. But it's the time of the year around budgets. It's like that with everything. We're going to hear the same thing with our own county departments because we don't need less as far as people in an ambulance or in a cop car or whatever, fire truck, anything like that. I mean, look what just happened in Charlotte. Four officers mowed down. So see, we got to really make sure everybody's safe and everything they need. So. Okay, uh, I normally don't make comments on national, international issues, but Ms. Thompson brought up all the um, insanity mm -hmm. that's ongoing at college campuses. Um, and so I really wish, and I, I said this to my wife and she told me not to repeat it, that all these young ladies that are advocating for Hamas and advocating for the throw of this government and the ending of the United States and Israel should have the opportunity to have a one-way plane ticket to Gaza yeah. and required to stay there for a minimum of one year and see if they are so pro-Hamas <laughs> after that 12-month period. I suspect that most of them will, quote, see the light, as the old saying goes. Um, they just, um, I think, indoctrinated. Uh, college today, apparently, is not what I had when I was in school, thank goodness. Yeah. Um, and I just really hate to see what's going on in Nashville. But I'm going to really... Usually I, I talk trash about uh, University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill uh, because I went to Wake Forest. But, but they are to really be praised with the saving of the flag and making sure that the American flag, flag stayed as Um uh, Just want to say thank you to Carolina. That's hard for me to do. <laughs> okay. Uh, Dr. Uh, Harris, Superintendent, uh, current Superintendent, the interim su Superintendent, and Dr. Butler before him uh, talked about cuts. They talked about the virtual school. They talked about many, many cuts. And I think we as a board of county commissioners need to, for the first time, listen to them. Don't take it as a threat. Take it as they're trying to help us and the taxpayers with our budget. And where they're asking for cuts, allow them to cut those positions. We can't do that anyway. That's the school board. The school board can cut the positions or not. Uh, there are two superintendents in a row that said we need to cut out the virtual school. They said we need to cut some of these positions. Uh, there's been a lot of print about uh, duplication and too many people at the administration's office. Uh, so I think we as a board need to listen and allow them to make those cuts, which will save us money that we do not have to give them for school supplementary positions and all kinds of things. If um, And by the way, the virtual school, uh, there are two state of North Carolina virtual schools uh, for different uh, grade levels, uh, which cost our taxpayers nothing, and that we've also looked into uh, one that's on a national level, which has extremely high graduation rates, uh, school scores, and so forth. So I think I would encourage ABSS, though that board, to look at those, at, at a minimum, three options for the virtual school. If their test scores are much higher, the uh, people are talking about how much better they like it. Uh, 
and it can we can move those virtual school people into some of the vacancies which the school board has not been able to fill for years, then it solves multiple problems. One, it saves the taxpayers. Two, it fills positions on the ABSS uh, category that they are struggling to fill by doing away with those virtual personnel and moving them into other vital positions. Uh, I don't foresee anybody losing jobs or positions if that is done. And that is uh, part of what Dr. Butler and I think Mr. Harrison is also addressing. So I think we as a board need to listen and allow them to make cuts where they're advocating for themselves to have cuts. Hey, Mr. Chairman, may yes, I make one more comment, please? Yes, sir. Um, I had a conversation with Senator Gailey about the uh, virtual program, and uh, she said that that particular program actually is a charter school with that comes under the ABSS banner, so they would actually be an internal charter program, and it wouldn't cost Alamance County anything for them to do that. Same same thing you said. So um, I think it's something we re they really need to seriously take a look at before we. I know there are a number of people who want to keep their kids in the virtual program. If that's the case, then we got a way to do it where it's not going to cost us money, and we got a program doing a better job, and as you just indicated, bring people. From that our program back into the schools fold where they need need to fill vacancies that sounds like a win-win for everybody and Ms. York, that will have a positive impact hopefully on your budget mm -hmm. Guys, I'm sorry, yeah. 69 um, current vacancies that they can count that as a cut and then the other ones that are looking at can move into those positions. It, you know, and it, it's just, it's a lot of work to do that. And, um, and it's also a lot to ask somebody to, who's really good at their job to move something to different. And it's just, it's people. We just have to really, we have to really work hard to make it work for our kids, whatever it takes. It's never always easy, is No, it? no, nothing's easy. Last comment, uh, prayers for Bill Lashley. Absolutely. Yes, okay, indeed. Mr. County Attorney. Yes, Board, no public comments from me this morning, but I do have two closed session motions for you to consider. Um, first, pursuant to North Carolina General Statute 143-318.11A3, I ask the Board move into closed session to consult with an attorney employed or retained by the public body in order to preserve the attorney-client privilege between the attorney and the public body. The attorney will advise the Board on ongoing legal matters, including the Allison et al. v. Allen et al. matter. Secondly, pursuant to North Carolina General Statute 143-318.11A5, I further ask the board move into closed session to establish or to instruct public bodies staff on negotiating or negotiating agents concerning the position to be taken by or on behalf of the public body in negotiating the amount of compensation or other material terms of an employment contract or other proposed employment contract. Don't anticipate any action in the open session after the closed session. I move that we go into closed session. Is there a second? Second. Any further discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? No. We're now in closed session. I am seated. Do <laughs> uh, we have a motion to adjourn? So move. Second. All in favor? Aye. Signify by saying aye. Aye. And leave. Thank you for watching the Alamance County Commissioner's Meeting. Commissioner meetings typically occur on the first and third Monday of each month in the Commissioner's Chambers at the County Office Building at 124 West Elm Street in Graham. The first Monday meeting begins at 9.30 a.m. and the third Monday meeting begins at 6.30 p.m. Changes to the meeting schedule will be posted on the county website at www.alamance-nc.com. The video of this meeting will be broadcast on LocalGov TV. Please go to www.localgovtv.com 
ncvnc.com for more information about their schedule and to see more videos produced by your local governments. You can also access this meeting through our YouTube channel at www.youtube.com forward slash Alamance County NC or by clicking the YouTube link on the county website. Technical questions regarding this meeting's broadcast or production may be sent to our county webmaster at webmaster at alamance-nc.com. This address is for technical questions only. Comments and questions about the content of this meeting may be made to the commissioners themselves. You can find their contact information at the Alamance County website at www.alamance-nc.com. There, you can click on the link that says County Commissioners to learn more about the commissioners, read minutes and agendas of commissioner meetings, and find other information about the county commissioners. You can also send mail correspondence to County Commissioners, 124 West Elm Street, Graham, North Carolina, 27253. Again, thank you for tuning in to the Alamance County Commissioners Meeting. Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments.